check one test testing one check one test test one check one test गल Check test.
Thank you. 
A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great pleasure that I welcome all of you to the International Conference on Frontiers in Chemical Technology 2020. We find chemistry in the smallest and the most minute of details in life. And today we amplify the findings of various scientists and some brilliant chemists from around the world for your knowledge and awareness. Uh, the International Conference on Frontiers in Chemical Technology 2020 will have a variety of topics which will focus on research and development under the domains of innovations in drug discovery and development, modern challenges in environmental and green technology, alternative energy sources for sustainable development, genomics and metabolomics, innovative strategies in chemical education, nanotechnology for sustainable development, engineering technology um, in the chemical industry, electrochemical and sensor technology, chemical technology in food and agro industry, cosmeceutical, nutraceutical and herbal product industry. Keynote speakers and plenary speakers who are renowned academics, both local and international, will be gracing this event physically and virtually throughout the three days. Before we begin, I would like to invite the following dignitaries to the head table. Chief guest, vice chairperson for, uh, for the University Grants Commission Sri Lanka, Professor Janita Lianage, conference chairperson for FCT 2020 and president of Institute of Chemistry Ceylon, uh, Professor Priyani Paranagama, 
President elect of Institute of Chemistry, Ceylon, Professor Sagarika Ekanayaka, Secretary for FCT 2020, and Honorary Editor of Institute of Chemistry, Ceylon, Dr. Samira R. Gunatilka, Editor in Chief for FCT 2020, Professor Kapila Senevi Ratna, Honorary Joint Secretaries of Institute of Chemistry, Ceylon, Dr. Ireshka De Silva, and Dr. Chainika Padmadasa. To commence the ceremony by kindling the flame of a very important tradition as we move on to the lighting of the oil lamp, I would like to invite the following dignitaries. I humbly request everyone to rise for the proceedings. Professor Janita Lianage, Professor Priyani Paranagama, Professor Sagarika Ekanayaka, Dr. Samir R. Gunatilaka, Professor Kapila Senevi Ratna, Dr. Ireshika De Silva, Dr. Chainika Padmadasa, Dr. A.A.P. Kirti, Mr. N.I.N.S. Nadarasa, and one of the participants for the conference from our very own crowd. Please rise for the national anthem.
I would like to request everyone to remain standing to observe a one minute silence for all those who have lost their lives due to COVID-19. Professor Priyani Ashoka Parnagama graduated from the University of Kalania in 1986 and obtained her PhD from the University of Glasgow in 1994 in the area of bioorganic chemistry. She is the director for the Institute of Indigenous Medicine, University of Colombo, also the president of Institute of Chemistry Ceylon. She is the chair and senior professor for the Department of Chemistry, University of Kalania, Sri Lanka. When it comes to life, we measure all and any success by the sense of direction we possess and our ability to achieve it. Such guidance can only be uh, provided with good leadership and a clear vision, and she has been our guiding light throughout it all. Now, I would like to invite Professor Priyani Paranagama, conference chairperson for the FCT 2020, to deliver the welcome speech for this occasion. All the council members, members of the Institute of Chemistry, members of the head table, past presidents of the Institute of Chemistry Ceylon, all the resource persons, academic staff members, participants of the conference, including who joined through the webinar today, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen.
it's a great privilege and a uh, and a pressure to welcome to first international conference on frontiers in chemical technology 2020 fct 2020 organized by institute of chemistry ceylon the successor to the chemical society in sri lanka in keeping with the vision of the institute of chemistry uplifting the quality of life for a better world through the advancement of chemical sciences and to mark the theme of the year shaping careers of chemists through the advancement of chemical technology the institute has taken initiative to organize this international conference frontiers in chemical chemical technology 2020 many eminent chemists from national and international universities research institutes from the business business world were invited to participate and share their experiences with the early career chemist who joined this conference to present their research findings from today 20th july to 22nd july i am proud to announce our co-organizers of this event royal society of chemistry uk upac opcw from the netherlands national science foundation sri lanka they are frontiers in exploration and innovation of chemical sciences and these organizations join hand with the institute of chemistry today to organize this event they are representatives of the organ these organizations share their experience with us other than the generous financial support given to us therefore this conference will be will provide an opportunity to all the young scientists to update their knowledge on new ventures of the field of chemistry i wish to uh, inform you all these abstract presented at this conference will be available in the e-repository of University of Kalania. Therefore, I thank the University of Kalania kindly accepting our request and agreeing to deposit all the abstract presented at this symposium will be available in the e-repository of University of Kalania. Since the Institute of Chemistry Ceylon is among the non-state university, we have very close association with the University Grant Commission. Now, I'm very proud to say one of our fellow chemists is serving as the Vice Chairman, University Grant Commission. It is a great privilege and honor to welcome our chief guest of the conference as she is a senior professor from my own department of chemistry University of Kalania. So I warmly welcome Professor Janita Lianage and the Institute of Chemistry Ceylon is grateful to you for kindly accepting our invitation and for sparing your valuable time to grace this occasion at this inaugural ceremony. I would like to welcome our keynote speakers although they couldn't physically attend the conference most of them joined through the webinar first let me welcome distinguished scientist professor ashok pandey biochemist from center for innovation and translational research csir indian institute of toxicology research Lucknow, India. I immensely grateful to you 
as you agreed to participate lively to deliver your keynote address, your participation is a profound impact to this conference. I also like to welcome Professor S. Soti Saram, Emeritus Professor of University from South Pacific Republic, uh, Fiji, to this, uh, to deliver this keynote address of the conference. I know he needs no introduction as he was the Dean of the College of Chemical Sciences, Institute of Chemistry for many years. He shared his great experience gained through the natural product research with us. Let me express my gratitude to Professor Soti Saran for agreeing to deliver a keynote address at the inauguration of this symposium. You know that we had to organize this event with great difficulties. Many obstacles we had to face. So with that, most of our resource person agreed to participate this event, especially those who join from other part of the world. But unfortunately, we had to change the inaugural session slightly due to unexpected incident happen because Professor Leslie Gunard, uh, Gunatilaka, is the Director, Natural Product Research Communication Center, University of uh, Arizona. We all know him. He's an eminent researcher, natural product researcher of world repute. He agreed to join with us until yesterday night, but unfortunately, due to the logistic problem that he had to face. If you look at the media, it is informed the worst affected state in the world is the Arizona state. So he couldn't uh, join today, but maybe later in the uh, other days, he will try his best to join, but he made his apology. But we'll, um, I would like to welcome his, he, Professor Gunatilaka also to this symposium because we all know his contribution that he made to the natural product drug discovery program is invaluable. Somehow he will not be able to deliver his keynote address, but we welcome you today, sir. And also, Dr. Sarah Thomas, Senior Program Manager, International Engagement Royal Society of Chemistry. She is delivering a keynote address to this Congress. I warmly welcome you, Madam. Julie Franklin, Career and Professional Development Advisor, Royal Society of Chemistry. It is my Pleasure to welcome both of you and my sincere appreciation for your cooperation and sharing the experience that you gained through the Royal Society of Chemistry and agreed to deliver keynote addresses at this conference. It's my honor and a great privilege to welcome Professor Neelakanti Gunawardana, Managing Directee, Director of Semio Chem Private Limited. She will be delivering very impressive keynote address based on how bring your research to the market to start your own business. It is timely needed topic since most of our research aim to make publications only. She is going to share her experience and the challenges that you that she has. Uh, gate a face and also you will have to uh, you know you will get a lot of uh, experience what we uh, what challenges that you have to face while 
develop a product and introduce to the market. That will be very useful to our early career scientists for their entrepreneurship development. It's my privilege to welcome Professor Amelia Rauter from Portugal University. She's the vice president of the UPAC Division of Organic and Biomolecular Chemistry. I met her several times at UPAC meetings. I'm very grateful to her as she agreed to join lively through the webinars to deliver plenary lectures. And she also agreed to deliver lecture at the Women Chemist Symposium that we organize as a one session of this FCT 2020. She is going to share her experience with us. A glance through the list of presentation planned for next three days by our plenary speakers revealed that they will be delivering lectures on the amazing diversity of different areas in chemistry. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome all the other plenary speakers who will be sharing their experience during this conference. Professor Todd Melsner and Professor Deb Melsner from Mississippi State University, USA. Dr. Rohan Pereira, OPCW, the Netherlands. Professor Channa Di Silva, Western Carolina University, USA. Professor Suri Narayan from Institute of Mycology, India. Professor Dinesh Mohan from Jawaharlal Nehru University, India. Professor Ayanti Navaratna, University of Peradeniya. Professor Nilwala Kottegoda, University of Sri Javadanapura. Professor Nimal Punyasiri, University of Kalambu. Professor Kapila Senaviratna, University of Kalaniya. Professor Damal Priyanta, University of Peradeniya. And he's a visiting professor at College of Chemical Sciences, Institute of Chemistry, Ceylon now. Dr. Samira Samarakon, University of Colombo. I greatly appreciate your contribution and agreeing to participate this conference as resource person. I warmly welcome all the participants of this conference. Due to COVID-19 pandemic, our foreign participants couldn't physically attend this conference, but majority of them agreed to join through the webinar while appreciating their participation and also for sharing your experience i warmly welcome all of you to this conference fct 2020 ladies and gentlemen an event like this cannot happen in a short time an event of this nature we had to organize within a short period of time, even though we planned it for a uh, year back, it was scheduled to, uh, you know, the organize from uh, on 17 June to 19 June, but the world changed us. You all know that we had to change everything unexpectedly. So, but the dedicated organizing committee took the challenge and amazing group of people, despite of their busy work, personal schedule, took the task of organizing this symposium, extending their fullest support wholeheartedly within a very short period of time. I would say three weeks. Even last week, we were discussing whether we have to postpone this. But we took the challenge and we thought we are going to face it. Therefore, I will fail my duties if I don't mention the energetic crew who 
of the organizing committee as the president of the institute of chemistry ceylon i cannot thank enough to dr ranmal gunatilaka conference secretary his magnificent effort to organize this event is commendable it was heartening to see him take up responsibility responsibilities of completing the star this task despite of many obstacles faced by us thank you very much dr ranmal gunatilaka i think we should give a round of applause his commitment commitment and dedication to organize this event unmatch i specially thank ms samadhi davalage and all the teaching assistant who help us in numerous ways they are young chemist with lot of talents they did various tasks from behind the scene in order to make this event a success i would uh, if i don't mention about the spirited work done by the rest of the members of organizing committee professor kamida senaviratna chief editor of the conference two secretaries of the institute of chemistry ceylon dr chainika padumadas dr ireshika di silva dr dinusha udukala dr meda gunaratna dr kirti atnayaka dr nimal punyasiri mr head together without their generous assistance we will not be able to organize this event successfully thank you very much for all the hard work done by you all i also need to thank mr sahan jay singer for serving as a graphic designer his outstanding contribution is admirable and also i thank mr hasant for organizing this webinar this is a new concept to all of us i really appreciate his tireless effort and support along with the it group and he did a marvelous job i thank all the members in the accounts branch and also all the members in the institute of chemistry uh, all the employers who help us in numerous ways i'm sure you will have a fruitful and rewarding exchanges in the next two days i wish you every success with important with this important conference and look forward to learning about the outcomes thank you very much thank you madam our chief guest for this momentous occasion is the vice chairperson of the university grants commission, uh, commission in sri lanka professor janita lienage uh, we are humble that you took some time off of your busy schedule to grace us with your presence today and now without further ado i would like to invite dr ireshika de silva secretary of institute of chemistry ceylon to read out professor janita lienage's citation Good morning ladies and gentlemen it gives me great honor to introduce our chief guest senior professor Chanita Elianege for the inauguration ceremony of the first international conference on frontiers in chemical technology organized by the Institute of Chemistry Ceylon senior professor Chanita Elianege received her bsc special degree in chemistry from university of sri chawadinapura in 1991 She obtained her PhD in analytical and speciations in bioinorganic chemistry from Cardiff University of Wales United Kingdom 
She has postdoctoral experience from Cardiff University of Wales, UK, University of Adelaide, Australia, and Atomic Energy Research Institute, Japan. Her main area of research is on chemical analysis and environmental speciation with many publications in referee journals and communications at scientific conferences, patents, and several books, book chapters and monographs published by recognized publishers. Her scientific and capacity building contribution has been recognized by prestigious national and international awards. She holds fellowships of the Royal Society of Chemistry, UK, and the Institute of Chemistry, Ceylon. Senior Professor Janita Lienege has served a member of Board of Directors and Acting Chairperson, Atomic Energy Authority, Chairperson, Board of Management, and Board of Study, Gampaha Vikramarachi Ayurveda Institute, Co-Controlling Examiner Chemistry, GC Advanced Level Examination, and Chief Examiner Chemistry, GC Advanced Level Examination. Her contribution to the Institute of Chemistry Ceylon has enormous serving in different capacities for more than 20 years. To name a few, Honorary Joint Secretary, Honorary Editor, Secretary for International Relations, Chairperson Inter-School Chemistry Quiz Committee, Member Academic Board, College of Chemical Sciences, Member Educational Committee, and Council Member of the Institute of Chemistry Ceylon. Senior Professor Janita Lienege has also served the Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science in a similar manner. Most importantly, she served as the President, Section E2 Chemical Sciences in 2017, and currently as the General President, Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science. Her commitment to the advancement of chemical sciences and in general science is very much exemplified by her enormous contribution to the Institute of Chemistry Ceylon and the Sri Lanka Association for the Advancement of Science. Senior Professor Janita Lienege has served as the head department of chemistry, University of Kalania and the director, Gampaha Vikramarachi Ayurveda Institute. Currently, she is the competent authority of Gampaha Vikramarachi Ayurveda Institute and the vice chairperson of the University Grants Commission, Sri Lanka. Madam, you are a role model, well respected, admired, morally upright, and with great charisma and character. Your achievements set the standard very high for all of us. Madam, we are honored to have you with us today amidst your busy schedule. Now, I take this opportunity to invite Senior Professor Chanita Lienege, Vice Chairperson of the University Grants Commission, Sri Lanka, to deliver the Chief Guest Address. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much, Dr. Reshika, for the nice introduction. Even I didn't know some of them. <laughs> she has found it from where she has found them. I didn't give anything to her. <laughs> so once again, good morning, Senior Professor Priyani Parnagama, the President of the Institute of Chemistry and the Chairperson of this conference. Uh, Professor Ashok Pandey, the keynote speaker from India and Professor Soti Saram, the keynote speaker from Fiji in this morning, and all the keynote speakers of the, this conference uh, and all the speakers, members of the head table, council members of the ICMC, invited guests, members of the ICMC, researchers and participants. Actually, my mind, mind goes back to early 1990s 
when I joined the Institute of Chemistry as a graduate chemist, when I just after graduating uh, as a uh, chemistry special graduate from University of Sri Jayawardenepura. Then I'm very respectfully thankful to the late Professor Jane No Fernando, who invited me to join the uh, education committee at that time, just after I returned from my PhD. Those days, those all the meetings were held in uh, Mount Evlevnia, where the library building was situated. So since then, I was, I have been serving in the institute in many activities. Then Professor Tuli de Silva gave me a big task and admitted me to the council of the ICMC as the editor. Then I held many voluntary uh, services, I, positions in the ICMC council, then the College of Chemical Sciences and related committees up to now. I'm very thankful to my colleague, Professor Priyani Paranagama for inviting me as the chief guest uh, today and the council of ICMC for approving that nomination. I'm, I consider it as a great honor to be amongst you all, a great chemist at this international conference, Frontiers in Chemical Technology 2020, FCT 2020. I believe that FCT 2020 will be an incentive for shaping careers of young chemists to the advancement of chemical technology. So as a lecturer, I must ask, what is technology? Right. So I will, I'm not going to ask you any questions. Um, I will just give you the answer also, right? Chemical, the, the technology is the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes, especially in industry. And then what is chemical technology? When thinking about chemical technology, most people just think about application of different chemicals. But it is a vast area than that. It is a combination of basic knowledge of chemistry with engineering tools in order to bring new products and processes to the market. So scientists involved in chemical technology should make decisions, invent new processes, construct instruments and facilities, find the way to make products from raw materials using technology and make processes cost effective and environment friendly. Why it is different from chemical technology from chemical engineering? Now chemical engineering in generally covers all the subjects which are required to be studied at basic for the chemical technology subjects. Chemical engineering is more to do with designing of equipments and chemical processes. But chemical technology is like specializing in some particular area like pharmaceutical technology, dyes and pigment technology, polymer and rubber technology, food processing, and many more. The application of chemical technology includes repairing of damaged human tissues, delivering drugs to specific cells, improving efficiency of solar energy production, higher performance of plastics for aerospace and other applications, constructions of vehicles, and so on. So chemical technologies can be involved in many areas. The demand for chemical technology will continue to increase as automation, new products, and complex production processes become more sophisticated in the chemical industry area. In particular to Sri Lanka, 
The chemical technology is the study of different processes in chemical industry. For example, study of processes of production of ammonia or study of processes of petroleum refining, study of processes of production of caustic, caustic soda and etc. Which are proposed to be established in Sri Lanka with the new government vision, vistas of prosperity and splendor under chapter, C, chapter six, technology-based society. So the chemical technologies have a very good opportunity and demand even in Sri Lanka in future. The Institute of Chemistry Ceylon has proved to be a, the center of excellence in chemical sciences for the socio-economic development through education, research and innovation. In keeping with the vision of the University Grants Commission of providing knowledge and leadership for a better Sri Lanka and ultimately a better world, the education arm of the Institute of Chemistry, the College of Chemical Sciences has committed itself to imparting quality education in chemistry. Hence, the approval was granted to award a Bachelor of Science Honours in Chemical Science degree by, by the Institute of Chemistry, Ceylon. We at the University Grants Commission believe that the provision of undergraduate, postgraduate and professional education of highest quality with high impact research and quality teaching in an industry engagement would enable the creation of lifelong learners in the global environment. Modern research in chemistry can lead to technologies that aim to benefit the environment, conserve, the, conserve and produce energy, etc. And finally, improve the quality of human life. So this conference provides a common platform for the professionals of the scientific and industrial arenas to share knowledge on emerging chemical technologies and to provoke interest in young, chem young chemists towards development in chemical technology. I believe this conference will be an eye-opener for the young chemists aspiring to be the, uh, the future chemi in chemical industries in Sri Lanka. I congratulate the team led by Dr. Anmal, who were behind this great initiative and has rendered support to shape careers of chemists through the advancement of chemical technology. And finally, I believe that the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. So thank you very much and have a fruitful conference in two days. Thank you. Now, now I would like to invite Dr. Ireshika De Silva to present a token of appreciation to our chief guest, Professor Janita Lienage. Thank you. 
Uh, I would like to uh, bring to your attention uh, that we had to limit the crowd in this auditorium to maintain social distancing. So many of the participants uh, for FCT 2020 will be joining us uh, via Zoom, uh, Facebook Live, YouTube Live, and also it is um, broadcasted via parallel projection in another hall. Even though it was uh, Professor Leslie Gunatilaka who was supposed to deliver the next keynote address today, as Professor Priyani Panagama mentioned, uh, due to the current state of the pandemic in the state of Arizona, he could not arrange the logistics. Uh, therefore, I would like to apologize for any inconvenience, inconvenience caused. However, an eminent scientist from the very same field, Professor Subramaniam Sotiswaran, Professor Subramaniam Sotiswaram will be joining us with a pre-recorded presentation on effectiveness of anti-diabetic medications from tropical plants in the control of medications, uh, in the control of blood sugar levels in diabetic patients. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Chainika Padamadasa to introduce Professor Sotiswaram. Professor Subramaniam Soti Swaran graduated with a first class Bachelor of Science Honours Degree in Chemistry from the University of Ceylon in 1963. Thereafter, he proceeded to obtain Doctor of Science degrees in Natural Products Chemistry and Physical Organic Chemistry from the University of Hull, United Kingdom. Currently, Professor Sothi Swaran is an Emeritus Professor of the University of the South Pacific, Fiji. He joined the University of South Pacific, Fiji in 1986 after a distinguished career at the University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka, including winning a gold medal shared award from the President of Sri Lanka for teamwork in harnessing natural resources in Sri Lanka and for developing a center of academic excellence in natural products chemistry at the University of Peradeniya. Professor Sothi Swaran has been attached as a visiting professor at Dalhousie University, Halifax, Canada and at Waikato University, New Zealand. He has also spent postdoctoral periods in research at the University of Tasmania, Australia, Mahidal University, Thailand, and Australian National University, Canberra, Australia. Professor Sothi Swaran served as the Dean of the College of Chemical Sciences, Institute of Chemistry Ceylon in Sri Lanka during 2012 to 2014. He teaches many aspects of organic chemistry. He's a physical organic chemist, natural product chemist, and also environmental chemist and a biochemist. Professor Sothi Swaran has more than 100 scientific publications in refereed international journals and more than 100 scientific publications at international and regional conferences. I now humbly invite the audience to listen to the video presentation we have of Professor S. Sothi Swaran. Effectiveness of anti-diabetic medication from plants. The, the next three slides, I'll be referring to some information on diabetes. As most of you know, 
Diabetes is a disease which results from the inability of the body to burn up sugars, starches and other carbohydrates. Insulin is a hormone normally produced in sufficient amount by the pancreas. So sugar accumulates in the blood and is filtered out by the kidneys in the urine. So therefore, we must try to uh, take some medication to permit the pancreas to uh, produce more insulin. Some more, in, some more information on diabetes. Diabetes cannot be uh, cured but can be controlled. But now uh, there are two types of diabetes as you know, type 2 and type 1. Together with either medication, patients are advised to adopt a diet low in carbohydrates with due care not to completely change to a keto diet, mainly proteins and fats. It is interesting that Ayurvedic physicians have used herbal treatments for to type 2 diabetes for centuries. Animal trials have proved that some herbal Ayurvedic medications are indeed effective against type 2 with diabetes, but there are some conflicting reports in some cases. This slide gives some information on herbal, herbal remedies for diabetes. And uh, the following are some popular traditional remedies claimed for treatment of type 2 diabetes in India, Sri Lanka and Fiji. Karavila, Uluhal, Kurinja, Cinnamon, Tebu, Kotalehimbutu. Bitter melon. This is a wonder cure for diabetes and I am giving you some background information. Bitter melon has been used for as a medicine for many millennia, especially in Southeast Asia. And the biological name for bitter melon is Momodica charantia. It is known as bitter gourd or bitter melon and the English uh, in English and Karela in Hindi, Karavila in Singhala and Pavatka in Tamil. Some background information. The main reported use of bitter melon is for lowering blood sugar levels in type 2 diabetic patients. The grant of a US patent for the use of bitter melon as a treatment for diabetes to a company based in New Jersey started an interesting debate for biopiracy. This uh, slide shows a picture of uh, Karvila is a variety of bitter melon. This picture shows uh, this is the second popular variety of bitter melon, Karvila and Pavakai. More information on Karvila. The fruit is an excellent source of nutrients, and according to one report, you need to eat only one normal size of Karvila or Pavakai daily along with every meal to prevent type 2 diabetes from advancing. Uh, Karavila may help uh, by regulating the blood sugar level. level. But the main question is, which is the best variety of this fruit that we should use? Active chemicals in uh, Karavila. Charentine is a chemical substance obtained from Karavila. It was identified by uh, Lolit Kar and Rao in 1960. Uh, so we can uh, see that there are two different studies uh, according to this slide uh, report the isolation of charantine from Karavila. Chemistry of uh, charantine. It was thought to be uh, thought that these are active principles in the reported control for blood sugar levels. Remember that Karavila is taken oral, but in uh, in vivo study revealed that the above mixture of compounds had a negative effect and that a minor compound in the fruit may be responsible for the reported activity. More published data, subsequent studies showed that the fruit contains at least three active substances with anti-diabetic properties, including charantine, which has been confirmed to have a blood glucose lowering effect. Another compound is visicine, and an insulin, uh, it is an insulin-like compound known as polypeptide. It was claimed that these substances either work individually or together to help to reduce blood sugar levels. The slide shows the structure of visicine. It is also known that bitter melon contains a lectin that reduces blood sugar uh, concentrations by acting on peripheral tissues and suppressing appetite similar to the effects of insulin in the brain. This lectin is thought to be a major factor behind the hypoglycemic effect that develops after eating bitter melon. Results published in 2011. In January 2011, the results of a four-week clinical trial were published in a journal and this showed that a 2000 mg daily dose of bitter melon significantly reduced the blood sugar levels among patients with type 2 diabetes. Although the hypoglycemic effect was less than 1000 mg per day a dose of metformin. Some older studies 
Uh, it has suggested an association between beta melanin intake and improved glycemic control. A report published in a March 2008 issue found that beta melanin increased cellular uptake of glucose and improved glucose tolerance. 2012 study, uh, two authors claim that their study does not warrant the use of caravilla to treat type 2 diabetes and suggested more research in this area. They reported the study using 475 patients. 2012 study, but the main problem is the variety of uh, car caravilla used in the above study. This slide shows an Egyptian study conducted in 2017. Using uh, diabetes-induced rents, this study found a significant reduction in the serum glucose levels and claimed that Momotica charantia is useful in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. But again, what was the variety of Momotica charantia they used in their study? The question now is, the question is, if Caravilla does benefit type 2 diabetic patients, as claimed by many people, including some manufacturers of Caravilla pill, you can see in the next slide, what is the best variety we should recommend? This slide shows the products of beta melon that are available for use and uh, being sold in different pharmacies. Uh, therefore, from what I have said so far, more studies are required. At this stage, it can be concluded that clinical trial data with human subjects are limited and flawed by poor study design and low statistical power. A better designed clinical trials on the different varieties of Caravilla are needed to further elucidate its possible therapeutic effects on type 2 diabetes. At this stage, uh, when you talk about the effectiveness of Caravilla in treating type, type 2 diabetics is questionable. If they are indeed effective as claimed, we should identify the correct variety for further studies. It shows uh, about the bitter melon varieties. Bitter melon comes in a variety of shapes and sizes. There's a Chinese variety, there's Indian variety, and it is green to white in color. Between these two extremes are any number of intermediate forms on the uh, beta melon varieties. We, I, said I said earlier that there's the Indian variety and the Chinese variety. Now there are different varieties in Bangladesh, India, as I said earlier. They are called common name is Karela, Pakistan, Nepal, and other countries in Southeast Asia. The published report on um, Momotica Charantia do not specify the variety used in their study. This is the main problem. Here you can see the picture of the uh, Indian variety of uh, Momotica Charantia. Another variety of uh, Charantia. Another variety of uh, Momodica charantia. Here you can see the Chinese or the Japanese variety of Momodica charantia. Next move on to uh, Uluhal, the second uh, Ayurvedic herb, also called uh, fenugreek uh, in English and Vendayam in Tamil. This is a, this is a slight picture of uh, Uluhal. Fenugreek. What is the current situation of fenugreek and with diabetes? Well, a study conducted in 2015 by two people showed that a dietary supplementation of 10 grams of fenugreek per day in pre-diabetes uh, subjects was associated with lower conversion to diabetes with no adverse effects and beneficial possibly due to its decreased insulin resistance. More details of the study, a three-year randomized controlled parallel study for the efficacy of fenugreek and MET controls was conducted in men and women aged 30 to 70 years with uh, a criteria of pre-diabetes. Fenugreek powder, 5 grams twice a day before meals, was given to study subjects and progression of type 2 diabetes militants was monitored at baseline and every three months for a three-year study. Uh, this slide gives uh, more details uh, of the study and uh, due to time limitations, I am not going to go through all of that. Uluhal is recognized as being widely beneficial in the treatment of diabetes. Water in which uh, diabetes, uh, uluhal seeds have been boiled is also beneficial in reducing blood sugar uh, levels and in alleviating thirst in patients suffering from diabetes. The active compounds are mainly water soluble chemicals. A special paper concentrating on treatment for diabetic patients 
nutrition and exercise by chemist anthony almada says that vendem oluhar seeds comprise a potent bunch of phytochemicals that prove beneficial for diabetes and those with high blood sugar lipids a condition which can lead to high cholesterol and heart disease he observes that in one study powdered extracts of the seeds 5 grams per day over 3 months produced favorable changes in blood sugar levels of patients with minor type 2 diabetes and reduced both total cholesterol and ldl uh, cholesterol levels among heart patients healthy subjects showed no effects uh, this slide shows the products of uh, venu uh, fenugreek uh, available in pharmacies some more information on uh, fenugreek this should be avoided during uh, pregnancy induced diabetes and uh, avoid using uh, uluhal to control sugar levels when on anticoagulating drug called warfarin and one has to be beware of drug interactions the fraction in uh, uluhal it is thought that the active fraction of uh, uluhal extract in lowering blood sugar levels is a is a galactomannan rich soluble fiber and the galactomannans are polysaccharides there's more information on uh, galactomannan on this slide for hydroxy isoleucine a novel amino acid uh, potentiator of insulin secretion has been extracted from uluhal seeds this increases glucose induced uh, induced insulin release in the concentration range of 100 micro moles per liter to 1 millimoles per liter through a direct effect on isolated isolates of uh, Uh, Langer hands. Stimulating effect of the study was uh, strictly glucose dependent. Ineffective at low three uh, milli uh, millimoles per liter or basal five millimoles per liter of glucose. This slide gives you the structure of 4-hydroxy isoleucine. 4-hydroxy isoleucine. It's a major free amino acid. and it stimulates insulin secretion from perfused pancreas in vitro fenugreek administration has not been reported to cause any toxicological effects its regular consumption may therefore be beneficial in the management of diabetes move on to the third uh, plant, plant called gymnema sylvester in singala is mass better in tamil it's siri kurinja chewing these leaves suppresses the sensation of sweet This effect is attributed to uh, polyhydroxy uh, triterpenoids called gymnemic acids and gymnemocytes present in the leaves. Kurinja, uh, gymnema sylvester has been used in herbal medicine as a treatment for diabetes for nearly two millennia. Two clinical trials have shown that gymnema can reduce glycosylated uh, hemoglobin levels. Slide shows uh, the picture, the leaf of kurinja. gymnema sylvester chemical composition of uh, gymnema sylvester as i indicated earlier uh, they contain olanine type triterpenoid saponins known as gymnemic acids and uh, the individual gymnemic acids their saponins include several compounds as well as another saponin called gymne gymnemosoids and gymnema saponins Here you can see the structure of uh, one gymnemic acid, and uh, it's is present as I indicated earlier in the leaves. This is another structure of uh, gymnemoside. Some more information on gymnemoside, and uh, this slide gives you a large number of these compounds isolated, and uh, they were found to exhibit inhibitory activity. This is another structure of uh, gymnemoside A. You can see you can see that it is again a saponin. Chemical composition of uh, gymnema sylvester, and uh, as I indicated earlier, uh, they contain triterpene saponins belonging to the olanin and dimethyl species classes. Besides this, other plant constituents are flavones, anthraquinones, and several other uh, chemicals as uh, indicated in this slide. it is interesting to note that uh, this plant uh, also plant extract shows test positive alkaloids and leaves of this species yield acid glycosides 
and anthroquinones and their derivatives. Chemical composition of uh, Gymnema sylvester and as you can see from this slide, this herb is still being studied and the effects of the herb are not entirely known. Gymnema reduces the sweet taste of sugar when it is placed in the mouth and from the extract of the leaves were isolated glycosides known as gymnemic acid as I said, I said earlier which exhibit anti-sweet activity. This effect lasts up to about two hours. Some postulate that the herb may block the sugar receptors on the tongue. This effect was observed in isolated rat neurons. Some more information on the chemical composition of Gymnema sylvester. And as I indicated earlier, the active ingredients are thought to be the family of compounds related to gymnemic acids. And uh, they have also shown anti-diabetic effects in animal models and they reduce intestinal transport of maltose in rats when combined with acarbos and reduce absorption of free oleic acid in rats. Bioassay data. A water-soluble extract of uh, this plant caused reversible increases in intracellular calcium and insulin secretion in mouse and human beta cells when used at a concentration of 0.125 mg per milliliter without comprom compromising cell viability. This in vitro data suggests that extracts derived from this uh, plant may be useful as therapeutic agents for the stimulation of insulin secretion in individuals with type 2 diabetes. The rise in insulin levels may be due to regeneration of uh, the insulin producing cells in the pancreas. The trial data. Uh, this plant, uh, the leaves, can also help prevent adrenal hormones from stimulating the liver to produce glucose in mice and thereby reducing blood sugar levels. Clinical trials with type 2 diabetics in India milligrams per day of water soluble acidic fraction of gymnema leaves administered for 80 to 20 months as a supplement to the conventional oral drugs. Information on dosage, the leaf powder 3.5 grams, that is a teaspoon, two or three times daily before meals are recommended doses of uh, gymnema sylvester to control blood sugar levels in humans. We have uh, information on available of the sleeves in Australia in bottles, Gymnema Sylvester, 600 milligrams uh, bottles. This bottle contains 200 capsules uh, in two bottles uh, and the new customer price, the listed uh, price in Australia is $15.79. Let's move to another one, cinnamon. Tests have shown that cinnamon lessens the impact of high carb foods. Research shows that cinnamon slows the rate at which the stomach empties its contents and thus reduces the rapid rise in blood sugar levels after a meal. 300 grams of uh, pudding flavored with 6 grams of cinnamon significantly reduced gastric emptying uh, rate in one test. More information on cinnamon. Another test has shown that even as little as 1 gram of cinnamon three times per day over a period of 40 days produced approximately 20% drop in blood sugar levels. In vitro and animal tests have shown that compounds in cinnamon not only stimulate insulin receptors but also inhibits an enzyme that inactivates them. Use of cinnamon as an anti-diabetic medication. Consuming 1, 3 or 6 grams of ground cinnamon daily by patients having type 2 diabetes reduces a mean fasting glucose level by 18 to 29 percent. Triglyceride by 23 to 30 percent, LDL cholesterol by 7 to 27 percent, and total cholesterol by 12 to 26 percent. Use of cinnamon as an anti-diabetic medication. Water-soluble cinnamon extract consumed by type 2 diabetic patients three times a day for 40 days reduced the blood sugar level by 10.3 percent. Cinnamon tea made by dipping three sticks of cinnamon bark in a glass of water lowered the blood glucose levels in moderate diabetics by about 10%. Results of a study in Australia used to using Asian patients with moderate diabetes fasting uh, blood sugar levels of 140 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, this slide shows uh, some uh, chemicals. It has been shown that methyl hydroxy chalcone polymer is the most active compound in cinnamon that increases glucose metabolism by enhancing glucose uptake, glucose transport across cells and glycogen synthesis. Anderson et al. isolated and characterized 
the uh, polyphenol type of A polymers from cinnamon and found that these substances act as insulin like molecules. Cinnamon extract lowers gl glucose, insulin and uh, cholesterol in people with elevated serum glucose according to R.A. Henderson and its co-workers. In a journal of uh, traditional and complementary medicine, volume 6 issue, uh, in 2000, issued in 2016. This slide shows uh, a picture of uh, the uh, cinnamon uh, found in Sri Lanka, bark, cinnamon bark. Varietal differences. The authors of a 2012 review concluded that cinnamon was no more effective than placebo, another active medication or no treatment in reducing glucose levels and a glycosylated hemoglobin, a long-term measurement of glucose control. The authors called for further studies of a more rigorous type of uh, uh, to examine the effects of cinnamon on type 2 diabetes. Cinnamon variety, several different varieties of cinnamon are sold in the US and they are typically categorized by two different types. Ceylon cinnamon, also called true cinnamon, it is the most expensive type. Cassia, a less expensive and found in most food products containing cinnamon. While both types are sold as cinnamon, there are two, uh, there are important chemical differences between the two. Ceylon uh, cinnamon versus uh, cassia, which is better. Both varieties of cinnamon likely uh, lower blood sugar and, and fight diabetes. But studies in humans are still needed to confirm that Ceylon uh, provides more benefits than cassia. Some more information on Ceylon uh, cinnamon versus cassia, which is better. Cassia cinnamon is not only uh, lower in antioxidants, it's also high in, in a potentially harmful substance called coumarin, an organic substance found in many plants. Several studies in rats have shown that coumarin can be toxic to the liver, leading to concern that can cause liver damage in humans as well. Accordingly, the uh, European Food Safety uh, Authority has uh, set the tolerable daily intake for coumarin at 0.1 mg per kilogram, kilogram body weight. Ceylon cinnamon versus cassia, which is better. Cassia cinnamon is particularly high in coumarin and you can easily consume more than the upper limit by taking cassia cinnamon supplements or even eating large amounts of it in foods. However, Ceylon cinnamon contains much lower amounts of coumarin and it would be difficult to consume more than the recommended uh, amount of uh, coumarin with this type. This uh, slide shows the structure of coumarin. Other plants with substantial coumarin content are cassia cinnamon or cinnamon, cinnamon cassia, not to be confused with the true cinnamon. Cinnamon verum or Ceylon cinnamon, cinnamon zelanicum, which contains little coumarin. Ceylon cinnamon versus cassia, which is better. Using average coumarin levels for cassia cinnamon, this would be equivalent to about half teaspoon, 2.5 grams of cassia cinnamon per day for a 75 grams uh, kilogram individual. Additionally, people with diabetes who take medication for insulin should be careful when adding cinnamon to their daily routine. The addition of cinnamon on top of your current treatment may put you at risk of low blood sugar, which is known as hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is a potentially life-threatening condition and is recommended to talk to your doctor about incorporating cinnamon into your diabetes management. Use of cinnamon as an anti-diabetic medication. Inclusion of the correct variety of cinnamon in the daily diet of people with type 2 diabetes will reduce the risk associated with diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. Cinnamon can improve glucose metabolism and the overall condition of individuals with diabetes, not only by hypoglycemic effects, but also by improving the lipid metabolism, antioxidant status and capillary function. Consumption of cinnamon continuously for more than 20 days is more beneficial than shorter use in people with type 2 diabetes. Let's move to another plant that is Tebu, that's a costus speciosus. It's an indigenous herb of about 2 to uh, 3 meters for height found in shady places of the low country. Leaves are edible and there is a popular belief that they can reduce uh, blood sugar level and are hence good for diabetics. 
A 2016 study on the roots, aqueous and methanol extracts reduced initial blood glucose level of uh, 387 to 120 milligrams per deciliter and 303 to 161 milligrams per deciliter respectively at the end of uh, 20 minutes, 240 minutes in diabetic rats. A similar study on the oral glucose tolerance test also suggested that aqueous and methanol extracts of uh, this species were highly effective in bringing down blood glucose levels uh, at the end of 20 to 140 minutes. Uh, this slide shows uh, the publication uh, on uh, this plant. More information on this plant. This plant is native to Southeast Asia and surrounding regions from India to China to Queensland. It is especially common in the greater Sunda Islands and in Indonesia. It's also reportedly naturalized in many other countries, including Fiji. Here you can see uh, the picture of uh, Costa speciosus leaves. Chemicals in uh, Costa speciosus leaves, they are mainly diagenins, a compound used for the commercial production of various steroids, such as progesterone. It is not known if the steroids present in the plant are responsible for the anti-diabetic properties. Let's move to the next plant, Kotala Himbutu, uh, which is a Celestia species. And uh, work has been reported by Serasinga and its uh, co-authors. Oral hypoglycemic effect of Celestia reticulata in uh, streptozotic sin induced ra diabetic rats is published in Phytotherapy Research in 1990. Some more information on Kotala Himbutu. Sri Lankan Kotala Himbutu is very much sought after. Illegal exports to Japan are now banned. Drinking cups made of Kotala Himbutu can be purchased in Sri Lanka. They are being promoted for use amongst diabetics to control sugar levels by drinking water from the cup. Diabetics are told to add water into the cup, leave it for 12 hours and drink the water extract of uh, this plant that have uh, low uh, blood sugar levels lowering qualities. The unfortunate situation is that Kotala Himbutu cups used once do not dry effectively and sometimes are used by unsuspecting diabetics drinking water the next day. We have noticed fungus in these cups that are not well dried after you eat use. The use of these cups should be stopped and diabetics should be told to use Kotala Himbutu plant powder instead of uh, instead to obtain uh, water extracts for drinking. Kotala Himbutu biscuits are also available in Sri Lanka. However, no clinical trials have been conducted on the effectiveness of these biscuits as an effective blood sugar lowering agent for diabetes. Some more information on chemistry. Multiple compounds with hypoglycemic effects have been isolated from celestial species. Many triterpenes, hydrocarbons and cytosterol have been isolated from roots and stem bugs. The root of the plant has been reported to contain mangiferin, cotylenol, and selecinol. Uh, this slide shows uh, structures of some compounds isolated from Celestia reticulata. Uh, some more structures of uh, compounds found in this plant. Uh, this slide shows the structure of uh, selecinol, neocelecinol, neocotylenol, and cotylenol. Some more information on the chemistry. Salicinol is able to reduce the serum levels of glucose at higher doses. Mangiferin directly acts on liver cells. Suppresses gluconeogenic pathway uh, by down-regulating fructose resulting in the decrease of fasting blood sugar levels. With regards to using plant extracts, Salicia reticulata root extract appears to be the most effective in reducing blood sugar levels. Anti-diabetic activity. It is attributed to the inhibitory activity of intestinal enzymes such as uh, alpha glucosidase and alpha amylase. Inhibition of these enzymes delays the glucose absorption into the blood and suppresses postprandial hypoglycemia. This results in improved glycemic control. Hypoglycemic effect. The three compounds that 
mentioned earlier, are primarily believed to be responsible for its hypoglycemic effect. In 2018, Hiromi and his research collaborators reported a thiocyclitol compound isolated from the plant with hypoglycemic properties. In addition, several other compounds uh, such as dulcitol, tannins, etc., have been isolated from the plant, but how each constituent act on peripheral psychological processes of human, human body is not well understood. Animal studies, Sierra Singer and his research group in 1990 demonstrated the ability of an aqueous extract of this plant to inhibit hypoglycemia using fasted male sprague or sprag dolly rats. Diabetes was induced in these rats by injection of uh, streptozotocin. Diabetes was confirmed by testing blood sugar, uh, blood glucose, and the experiments were carried out after seven days after diabetes was induced. In all cases, the animals were fasted for 16 hours, and the test group received Kotalahimbutu orally as single point intervention, while the control group received only water. Blood glucose levels, the results showed a significant lowering of blood glucose from 23 millimoles per liter at baseline to 16 millimoles per liter at three hours and 8.7 uh, millimoles uh, per liter at four hours in the Kotala Himbutu group. Controlled diabetic rats at baseline had blood glucose of 24.9 millimoles per liter following the administration of water showed a transient reduction of blood glucose to 23.8 millimoles per liter at three hours, followed by a rise of 27.5 27, millimoles uh, per liter at four hours. Uh, this uh, slide shows Ayurvedic diabetic preparations. The first one, Kotala Himbutu tea that's available in packets, and also Kotala Himbutu biscuits that are also available in uh, certain shops. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Chainika Padmadasa to present the token of appreciation to Professor Priyani Parnagama, who will be accepting it on behalf of uh, our keynote speaker. Thank you, Madam. We now have the keynote address by Professor uh, Ashok Pandey on waste to energy as an attractive solution for resource recovery and sustainable de development. To introduce our uh, second keynote speaker, I would like to invite Dr. Ireshika De Silva, Secretary of the Institute of Chemistry, Ceylon. Professor Ashok Pandey obtained his master's degree in chemistry in 1976 and PhD in microbiology in 1979 from the University of Allahabad, India. His major research and technological development interests are industrial and environmental biotechnology and energy biosciences, focusing on biomass to biofuels and chemicals, waste to wealth and energy, and industrial enzymes. He has nearly 1,400 publications and communications, which include patents, books, papers, and book chapters. Professor Pandey is the recipient of many national and international awards and honors, including the prestigious title of Distinguished Professor of Eminence with Global Impact in the Area of Biotechnology. He is fellow of various academies, which include the Royal Society of Biology, UK, and International Society for Energy, Environment, and Sustainability. Professor Pandey is the founder president of the Biotech Research Society India, 
and founder and international coordinator of International Forum on Industrial Bioprocess France. He is the editor in chief and the honorary executive advisor of several international journals. Professor Pandey is a junk visiting professor scientist in many foreign universities and also in several universities in India. Formerly, he was eminent scientist at the Center of Innovative and Applied Bioprocessing Mohali and chief scientist and head of biotechnology division and Center for Biofuels at CSIR National Institute for Interdisciplinary Science and Technology, India. Currently, Professor Ashok Pandey is Distinguished Scientist at the Center for Innovation and Translational Research, CSIR, Indian Institute of Te Toxicology Research, India, and Executive Adv Director Honorary at the Center for Energy and Environmental Sustainability, India. Now, I cordially invite Professor Ashok Pandey, who joined us today via webinar to deliver the keynote address on waste to energy as an attractive solution for resource recovery and sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, am I audible to everyone? No, we Hello. Can you, we can hear you. Sir. Okay, that's great. So I'll share my screen now. Uh, uh, you have to, you have to enable it to. Sir, uh, we, we cannot still uh, see the screen. We because, can see you, but uh, not the screen you're sharing. Because I'm getting the message that host has disabled participant screen sharing. So you have to enable it, then only I can hear, I can share it. Kindly enable script sharing. Yes, sir. we are working on the technical difficulties here. Please hold. Can you see now? Yes, sir. Thank you. Sir. That's great. Okay. So, uh, good morning once again to everyone. I am going to present to you uh, a talk on waste to energy as an attractive solution for first recovery and sustainable development. I choose this talk because the uh, uh, it is uh, broadly but you would understand and appreciate that uh, a, a lot more in what we understand with the uh, chemistry as the basis. In fact, every kind of life, every kind of uh, uh, environmental aspect, every kind of uh, uh, material development, whatever we see, chemistry has become a kind of a point. And same is uh, uh, true today for uh, the inner order of the world and also for the management of uh, uh, energy, including alternative energy. So, uh, very briefly, on uh, what I will. Uh, so, I'm, I, I'll very briefly talk about uh, uh, the institute from where I am, and then you give you a, a quick. Uh, uh, details on waste, what today we are talking about, uh, uh, what I'm going to present to you, and then how valuable to, uh, this waste are uh, to generate what you call wealth, that is to re recover whatever uh, uh, valuable uh, chemicals and fuel we can recover from organic fraction of uh, such waste. And then uh, since last uh, decade or so, we are so uh, strongly talking of our circular economy, and how a linear economy 
should move towards circular economy and more specifically that uh, that uh, bioeconomy. That because when you say biomass, when you say uh, bioprocessing, green processing, etc., the term circular bioeconomy is much more relevant uh, in a closer perspective. And then you uh, also give you some quick examples on the challenges, etc., what we face when we look at uh, possibilities of converting solid waste to different kind of energy, in particular biofuels, and also talking about the opportunities, and then a couple of slides on what we have, what initiative we have taken in India and how it has uh, relevance for uh, global uh, perspective. So I come from uh, CSIR, which is a Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, the prime uh, scientific organization under public sector in India. This is CSIR map of India, what you see here, which has uh, 38 uh, institutes, and each of the institute has very specific uh, uh, working cha charter. So almost three decades I had been working on this, uh, if you see right side bottom, National Institute uh, for Interdisciplinary Science and Technology, where I established uh, biotechnology research and also the first public uh, sector uh, pilot plant on uh, uh, biofuels. And then uh, since uh, a little more than two years, I moved to the northern part of country, a laboratory is called, you see on right side top, Indian Institute of Toxicology Research, where I primarily I put my attention on uh, uh, Center for Innovation and Translational Research. The basic aspect of this center is to uh, see that what uh, industrial development could take place on the technologies, whatever we develop in the institute, or even uh, uh, to tie up with industries for various kind of uh, collaboration. Uh, th this is how this uh, international toxicology research. This is very unique inst uh, institute. Uh, so we have uh, industrial research and occupational research. But in uh, uh, since a couple of decades, the consumer safety has become very important. We have a couple of approaches which are investigative as well as mechanistic, uh, mechanistic, and then we are heavily involved into predictive research as well as also do risk uh, assessment. So as I have mentioned that uh, one of the major strength of the institute has been also industrial linkages. And in past uh, uh, few years, more than 200 industries we have uh, uh, served. And of course, we participate in uh, most of the uh, important national missions and uh, programs. So our institute, if you look at a glance, it has a four verticals, the primary uh, focus on translational uh, research in toxicology where we look at basic and applied research, but then we have a uh, uh, huge uh, responsibility because we are a legally recognized uh, NABL and GLP laboratory and uh, referral institute or referral body for any matter on regulatory toxicology. Like any other research organization, the third vertical deals with the skill development and outreach program and uh, including human resource development. So a large number of training on uh, the areas of our uh, interest we conduct regularly for uh, uh, Indian as well as overseas uh, participants. And the fourth vertical, which uh, I very briefly mentioned to you, is called CITAR, Center for Innovation and Translational Research, uh, where we have our R&D partnership with industries, we have consulting services with industries, and also we provide different kind of uh, services to industries, various kind of uh, models are present to interact with industries. And also we support uh, startup uh, particularly through our own uh, uh, researchers. So uh, a few more information about this center. What is most important that probably it is one uh, group where we can find any kind of most modern and most advanced instrumentation for carry out in, carry on research on uh, uh, molecular biology facility, cell biology facility, computational toxicology facility, one of the best perhaps in the, uh, uh, in the world. So uh, now I come to the scientific part of the presentation. So waste to well, this has become very common word that uh, W2W and W2 energy. And uh, today the whole world, particularly those who have issues related with uh, the solid waste, have put huge emphasis on deriving uh, different kind of chemicals from uh, solid waste and also uh, considering that there is a huge energy potential of this solid waste, in particular agro-industrial residues uh, uh, 
for generating various kind of uh, fuels, bio oil, etc., bioethanol, etc. So that has become again one of the most uh, talked and discussed uh, topic uh, globally. And we look at uh, uh, sustainable developmental goals, uh, 17 goals set by United Nations. Broadly, when it took at waste, food, energy, environment, and all that, we find that these two are very relevant, very relevant, or highly relevant for at least seven to nine uh, uh, sustainable development goals set by uh, by United Nations. So the, the the bottom line is that what kind of resources we can recover and uh, from this waste, and in order to bring some kind of uh, uh, energy and environmental sustainability because again if you look at uh, paris convention and after that the agreement signed at uh Rica in poland uh practically entire world 209 countries have signed this treaty and they would want to every country has given a commitment of reduction of greenhouses gases emission so as to control the rising in environmental temperature and resulting rising uh, uh, ocean level and also depleting ozone layer in atmosphere. So from this perspective, these aspects have become uh, of great relevance for any research organization anywhere in the world. And much more important, perhaps is collaborative effort uh, within country and internationally in order to attain this uh, sustainability uh, goals. So uh, uh, from this point, when you look at, uh, because uh, I, uh, I tried to talk about solid waste, so we have three major kind of solid waste. The most nuisance is municipal solid waste. Uh, I will uh, talk a little bit about this one. And then agri-crop residues, again, they are of great uh, concern. And then food waste, uh, which is also of uh, uh, great uh, relevance. So let us look at uh, what is the current scenario on all those things. So when we talk of food loss and food waste, we know that uh, uh, roughly one third of the food produced in the world of human consumption, uh, you know, approximately uh, 1.3 billion tons get lost or wasted. Get lost and wasted when I say that uh, it rots in the, uh, because uh, uh, of a poor storage condition, because of the infestation of, uh, or uh, whatever other kind of uh, uh, reason could be. Now, having known that uh, 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 almost one third population of the world does not get a two meal to eat or does not get a nutritive meal to eat in terms of uh, cereals and uh, uh, grains, this kind of loss can we afford? Uh, the answer is very simple. No, we cannot afford. So what are the uh, possibilities to do that we need to improve those conditions which lead to such loss losses or alternatively, we need to find alternative application of such uh, uh, food with such damaged food or uh, grains and cereals, etc, etc. So uh, some uh, uh, other informations are given in terms of data that uh, what kind of waste in uh, developing countries and uh, uh, developed countries and uh, uh, has been taking place in such uh, such uh, uh, food waste. Uh, some more statistics look at uh, total per capita food production for human consumption is about 900 kilogram in uh, in rich countries. That is what normally we we classify as. Uh, uh, developed countries and uh, almost half we have same thing in the these are the average figures what you call developed uh, developing countries or uh, countries which are less developed or considered as a poor in the in the world so whatever it could be uh, whether it is a developed country developing countries less developed country whatever it could be the food losses are very unique anywhere in the world uh, which includes uh, India as well, and uh, even uh, sub-Saharan countries, which are considered perhaps the most poor in terms of uh, uh, per capita income and availability of uh, uh, availability of food. Even then, in those countries, there are food losses. A similar kind of information is again given here, so you can look at that uh, uh, how the losses are taking place. The red one are by the consumers and production to retailing. So this is what I'm trying to tell. If you look at the Europe, 
if you look at the north america practically the same industrial asia is uh, not uh, same but uh, just slightly less and sub saharan africa the losses are so huge that uh, in uh, production to retailing and uh, south and southeast asia and then we have latin america which is uh, having the top position in this chart in terms of per capita food losses and waste in kilogram per year and uh, when you talk particularly this could be stipulated the rich people can afford to perhaps throw much more food so this is what is happening in north of uh, america and oceania if you look uh, uh, retail level losses are substantially high so other kind of food waste are the agri, agri residues or crop residues and somewhere they are considered as residues and somewhere in considered as waste in terms of biotechnology nothing is waste and in terms of circular economy or bioeconomy there is nothing waste so uh, uh, these are the 17 major classes of uh, agri crop residues or food uh, crop uh, uh, residues which are available in any part of the world uh, many places as sur in surplus quantities and uh, many places they are simply burnt or uh, left in an open environment to rot but then these are highly rich in organic nature and they have also very good uh, uh, balance when we look at developing biological processes or even thermochemical conversion uh, to produce bio oil or other kind of uh, valuable chemicals so uh, this is how it uh, the term was coined on resource recovery so resource recovery from waste is essential to develop knowledge and tools to reduce pressure on the natural resources and create value from waste and it is largely seen as a tool to support a radical change in the waste management landscape so what happened that uh, normally when you talk of uh, environment and uh, waste management etc people have been talking of three r principle that is reduce reuse and recycle but we added this fourth r saying that uh, uh, fourth r being recover so uh, what are the options available or what are the pro uh, pro products we can get is of course energy different kind of uh, gases or liquid fuel of course solid fuel as well and then we have different kind of chemicals nutrients fertilizers metals uh, etc and uh, so what happens that in today's uh, world that uh, whether we like it or not like it whether we say that we are academician and would not like to do everything uh, would not like to establish everywhere business uh, kind of scenario but then if research does not find an application it cannot sustain uh, slowly the avenues to get uh, funding globally are shrink, are getting uh, shrunken and it is directly related with the with the availability of fund for just academic research so we need to develop always we need to keep in mind not always but as far as possible we do good science publish it but then it is essential that a portion of that uh, not less than at least half even in countries which are play, which are considered as developing countries that these are related with the uh, uh, process development for uh, business so this is what is mentioned here that uh, how transition from closed loop to circular economy uh, uh, what what importance it could have and how it should be uh, should be uh, 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 created the the process should be created the avenue should be created that from linear economy to circular economy we move and try to develop uh, opportunities for business for such resource recovery because you know waste disposal if you simply think of disposal it does not make much sense today then uh, the term was coined treatment and management so disposal does not come anywhere in the picture now it is treatment and uh, management and we say treatment and management is it is necessary that we produce revenues from this one because that revenue could uh, uh, be utilized in overall uh, balancing the the economic uh, equation of the process whatever we develop so this is a very typical kind of analysis so we do it with the people who are in the who are science manager who are uh, you know in uh, 
uh, analysis, who are uh, basic research, who are in industries, and we do key uh, keyword based uh, matrix. So you look at uh, when we talk of uh, energy and environmental sustainability, and uh, in that we put the keywords. So you can see that resources and regulation have become such a important, uh, have become of uh, great relevance and have huge importance in developing different kind of uh, sustainability uh, in enabling technology and skill development for developing business model. And obviously, uh, uh, all that we can do primarily once we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, opportunities to good science. So we have uh, regulatory changes, we have policy integration, and uh, we again cannot work in isolation. So international agreements have relevance, ecosystem services have relevance. Today we know that all the governments are committed on carbon emissions, then commercialization is of great relevance, linked together is infrastructure which is available, and this is where the, comes the relevance of again, uh, 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 collaborative if, uh, research and so on. So waste resource and resource paradox has also direct relationship with uh, consumer behavior. Unless we take uh, uh, a consumer into fold as one of the stakeholder, uh, this all cannot be achieved. So when we take resource recovery again from moving from uh, linear economy to circular economy, this is how the biophysical environment and this is how the the the, the movement of processes and uh, uh, application should be seen that we have uh, a utilization uh, and whatever product we have uh, it does not get utilized completely whether it is a preparation of food in home some food is left out or with the preparation of for example preparation of vegetable so, so the vegetable waste will be left out or whatever. So that is stuff here is leakage. Then whatever we have, we need to dispose it. Disposal is never 100%, there is again leakage. Then whatever we have disposed material, it, is, it needs to be stored and it needs to be returned to environment. This is how then it goes to environment. For example, we are taking uh, uh, out uh, uh, natural resources from the earth planet, but we need to replenish it. A simple example is about the taking out uh, sand from a river or taking out the utilization of uh, water which is in the river. There is a specific ratio that not so much from this should be uh, taken out. Otherwise, the resource itself will dry up. In many countries, several rivers have dried up because we take out much more sand than what is uh, speculated. So this is the entire cycle and it's very complex, but uh, unless and until we follow this kind of uh, production and application cycle, the, 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 uh, the process will not be sustainable. And in, in case of a business model over a period of time, it is bound to fail. So then uh, uh, I'll now move on to a specific example that what kind of uh, resources we can recover is this energy from solid host. We know that uh, municipal solid waste is a nuisance. So municipal solid waste is very complex. Again, it's a very different in uh, uh, from countries to countries. And in developing countries, uh, municipal solid, for example, in India, uh, I'm sure it is the same uh, in, in Sri Lanka. Every kind of thing we can think uh, is available in municipal solid waste. We dump everything, whether it is a leather waste, whether it is a non-biomass waste, it's a construction material, plastic, or any kind of uh, material, glass, metals, and all that, including household. So it is necessary that we segregate uh, this waste, and then uh, we try to utilize the organic fraction for generating uh, uh, either energy or some other kind of valuable product. So what is the current scenario? Uh, I have given an example in India versus uh, this is, uh, the whole world, large number of waste to energy plant that which have been put primarily they work on thermochemical conversion processes, fast paralysis in order to produce uh, biol and that biol could be utilized in different uh, ways. So this is very successful process, but it is necessary that uh, there should be segregation of uh, municipal solid waste in order to separate out uh, organic friction and uh, uh, 
non biodegradable fraction and only organic fraction should be utilized for uh, uh, developing bio processes or thermochemical processing of uh, such waste i am not going to read all the specific detail otherwise it definitely will take uh, too long time so then uh, energy from municipal solid waste uh, this is a sub example uh, uh, it it would take uh, much uh, it, uh, in india a large number of plants have been put and uh, 92 but uh, in realistic term uh, what we know that uh, hardly 11 or 12 are working uh, others are not working and one of the major reason is that segregation is not uh, proper the municipal solid waste generated in india is very bit than uh, other part of the world and uh, uh, so all with all those difficulties the power generated from municipal solid waste is almost two time expensive than whatever is uh, obtained from coal and other kind of uh, energy sources so there is a gap of uh, 50% uh, revenue and how to fulfill this revenue is a big question so obviously unless there is a policy recommendation by the government if you look at this uh, this uh, 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 what this matrix has shown you there is huge intervention by policy so this is how it is even if there is huge opportunities and all that uh, it is not uh, being popular and it is not uh, efficient so then we have been talking since more than a decade very strongly globally and started much strongly by 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 sweden that uh, zero waste generation and uh, putting the bringing the concept of bio refinery where every component of waste should be utilized effectively in order to bring not only economic gain but also to uh, go on to zero waste so as to attain environmental sustainability so uh, indirectly all such uh, applications offer huge uh, social sustainability as well because uh, when there is a utilization of for example a, a crop residue a straw for example which is uh, uh, normally uh, in many countries particularly those from tropical do not find adequate application because the surplus quantity of straw available at times it is burnt or uh, disposed improperly and so on so suppose there is industrial application of such waste uh, this will be of great relevance because there is a value addition to the waste bringing environmental sustainability it brings uh, again economic gain for the farmers so their status economic strength improves and also when we put up sub industry this offers job opportunities uh, for uh, uh, new industries so this way it offers not only environmental sustainability it also offers social sustainability and then once it is done following good principle of uh, science and engineering uh, quite likely with intervention of government policies it brings economic sustainability as well so this is where the the uh, the bioeconomy partnership uh, supply chain and risk uh, were envisaged and put together so dynamism of scaling the scale is very important again it uh, varies from place to place from country to country region to country for example when you talk of lignosolytic bioethanol in brazil it is conceived that the refinery should not be less than 100000 to 300000 uh, liters ethanol per day and what we in research in india considering that the farmer size and field size is too small and transportation cost cannot be added uh, for the feed stock itself uh, uh dot beyond a uh, distance of something like 40 kilometers or so and this is where we initiated very small distilleries based on lignosolytic ethanol and not more than perhaps something like 10000 liter ethanol per day and so on so scale is very important in order to determine the true feasibility depending upon the feed stock availability and the cost involved overall uh, what you call uh, what you call uh, uh, copex operational cost so we have uh, 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 sources resources we have methods then we have residues we look at the impact of utilization of these uh, sources and their residues and then what are the tools we have available what kind of team do have adequate team uh, with interdisciplinary skills and so on including business uh, model development the people who could uh, look at the market uh, Uh, and then uh, de uh, define what kind of business model should be adopted by them 
what are the timeline we should adopt and what kind of training opportunities to, uh, to, to improve the skills or all the scientific and business model available is available to the team. And then we need to look uh, if the entire thing is feasible or not, whether it is actionable or not, and whether it is sustainable or not. So if these circles are not met together, then the chances of success will be very, very low. We also have to have a lot of ethical issues. We also have to look at the knowledge development and cost involved. So this is how a circle of economy, uh, you know, opportunities and risk are uh, seen together. We have been, this is just to show you that we have been working on this aspect uh, uh, quite strongly with uh, global partnership with more than uh, 15 countries. And this is one of the recently published book on uh, this biorefinance, integrating biorefinance for this valorization. Very valuable book for beginner as well as for the industry part, uh, practitioner. So uh, some challenges and some risk, what are the main drivers for such a, uh, you know, uh, uh, opportunities, particular recovery of energy, specifically now on liquid biofuels, that is bioethanol primarily. So main drivers, what are the main drivers? As I mentioned to you that uh, bio waste management, commitment of the national government and so on. And then challenges that in many countries still there is a debate about food versus fuel availability of land. For example, India uh, policy does not allow utilization of uh, uh, food crop for making uh, fuel and also it does not allow agri land uh, for cultivation of uh, 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 energy crop. Of course, a private entrepreneur or private farmer can do anything. There is no binding on that. But as a policy, this is what is there. Risks are there, sustainability. Uh, major issue is deforestation taking place. Uh, uh, I do not have much time to give you a specific example that how uh, these are related, but if you, very briefly to mention you that uh, European Union, as several of you must be known, has completely banned uh, import of uh, uh, palm oil from Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, it, it has already started from January 2020 and uh, in successive steps in 2007, uh, it has to be completely stopped. And the reason has been that in order to produce more uh, uh, palm oil, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia are com constantly removing the forest and putting new uh, oil palm crop. So there is a continuous uh, removal of forest. This is not sustainable. Then this crop requires a huge quantity of water and huge quantity of fertilizer. Again, we know that this is uh, not sustainable. So even if these uh, are happening in Indonesia and uh, Malaysia, European Union, 28 countries have passed the resolution, they have implemented it, so that they will not import any more palm oil from Malaysia and Indonesia. And we know that the Malaysia and uh, Indonesia economy very strongly depend upon up to 60% is on export of palm oil to different uh, parts of the world. So even if they are sovereign countries, their economy and everything will be very badly affected. So what is the conclusion from this statement, what I'm making to you, that sustainability is a big issue and it is globally a, uh, a relevance. So in isolation, no country today can see this, that this is my right and I will do this or I will do that. If this impacts uh, environment, uh, the repercussions are always uh, bound to take place in some or other form. So, some other examples, I'll very quickly move on to this one that we have been talking about biodiesel and uh, biofuel. We know in several parts of the world, particularly again, tropical countries, biodiesel is not feasible because vegetable, biodiesel is produced from vegetable oil and vegetable oil is not available uh, uh, in many, many countries. For example, India, uh, 2009, the policy said that uh, use of 30% biodiesel, but ultimately the policies was withdrawn because in India we eat a lot of vegetable oil 
a lot of puri, a lot of uh, other kind of things, uh, fried items, etc. And for food application itself, uh, our production is hardly about 55%. About 45% of national requirement of vegetable oil is made through import. So obviously, there is no possibility of using such a uh, uh, vegetable oil for making uh, biodiesel. So there is no biodiesel production uh, uh, policy in India. It only deals with making bioethanol and that too only from lignocellulosic uh, uh, feed stuff, that's uh, agri-crop uh, deciduous. And uh, uh, some uh, uh, issues about that, how they are produced. So today we are talking of lignocellulosic biomass, and algal biomass. Uh, interestingly, for everything, uh, starting material is carbon dioxide because uh, plants uh, utilize carbon dioxide to make uh, uh, plant biomass and algal biomass utilize carbon dioxide to develop uh, algal biomass and how they can be utilized to produce different kind of uh, uh, fuels. In terms of business opportunities, uh, technology readiness level, what you call TRL, uh, so lignocellulose bioethanol, Technically, it is very sound today in most part of the many part of the world, not most, but then it is uh, just ready for commercialization. It is not getting commercialized because cost is inhibitive. Same is for uh, thermochemical processes, same as fermentation is best established uh, technologically, but uh, uh, the cost uh, is inhibitive, so it is not getting commercialized. Uh, and uh, gasification and methanol economy today, what uh, very strongly a group of scientists and researchers all over the world is talking of a methanol economy uh, and gasification to make, um, uh, uh, you know, bile, etc. Again, it is taking place very strongly, but then the cost is an issue. So unless this is resolved through policy documentation, policy direction from the government, perhaps in the very near future, when I say near, very near, near future, for sure, I can say 10 years or even longer, this will not be possible to commercialize them in full scale in most part of the of the world. The same thing about the cost is shown here. There has been a very huge hype about the algal fuel. Today we know that uh, in current scenario, even 10 years or 20 years, algal fuel cannot be commercialized as we had envisaged. And uh, uh, first generation ethanol, it cannot be, it is not available in most part of the world for making that is from sugar sources from starchy. <coughs> Sorry, feed is stop. So today we're talking silicic ethanol, but as you can see, it is also on uh, uh, red zone fissure trough, more technologically much more advanced. So fissure trough synthesis, but it is uh, much expensive than uh, even silicic ethanol. Biojet fuel, same thing, that it comes from fissure trough synthesis, but the uh, since the since the ecology value should be very high, it requires much more uh, intensive processing, and then it is quite uh, substantially high. So now the last part of this presentation, I will uh, quickly run through about what we have been doing. We established this. Uh, we have been in the forefront for developing position because policy documentation we act as uh, uh, India country you know uh, representative for international energy agency for developing uh, biofuel opportunities in India and so on so we started working and as I mentioned that uh, we put uh, we have put the first pilot plant on uh, on uh, lignocellulosic uh, bioethanol and it works uh, broadly on uh, the principle where every component of biomass and every waste stream or side stream generated is utilized uh, uh, in order to produce some chemical or some biochemical and so on. So this is uh, the concept of biorefinery, what we have put, we have biomass, which requires some kind of pre-treatment and exactly shown for acid pre-treatment to solubilize hemicellulose, that uh, solubilized hemicellulose is pentose sugar, uh, it goes for C5 fermentation, <coughs> uh, <coughs> I'll come back to this later. And after solubilization of hemicellulose, what is left out is cellulose and lignin. We know that biomass comprises cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin, and it is necessary to deconstruct these uh, components separately in order to utilize them efficiently <coughs> for developing such a bioprocesses. So in this processing, we have uh, Thereafter, uh, uh, enzymatic hydrolysis is carried out, and this enzyme we produce uh, on site. We are uh, again one of the people known as enzyme people. 
uh, not only in India, but uh, in terms of publication and patents, etc. Globally, we have uh, Latin Moro collaboration, several technologies, etc. We have transferred. So on-site enzyme production is one of the most important recommendation in order to achieve <coughs> better economic gains. And then this enzyme works on the cellulose to solubilize them to C6 sugars, which is converted depending upon the requirement. Because in biorefinery, I'll show you some example. I think I have a slide primarily to make ethanol, but in order to attain some basic uh, uh, economic gains, again, to utilize a fraction of this C6 sugars to make a high value products, for example, L lactic acid or so on, sorry, or even succinic acid, which is of huge demand today. Then we have left out is lignin, and there is huge exploratory research today to what you call lignin based biorefinery. To, but then most of these are on exploratory uh, level only. So what uh, in order to have economic sustainability, as I mentioned uh, several times to you, what we men, uh, uh, propose that uh, this C5 sugar should be utilized to make high value products, for example, L amino acid, L arginine and so on. And we achieved uh, huge successes on such one, including development of biode biodegradable polymers, uh, that is uh, uh, polyhydroxobutyrate and uh, so on. And then whatever, uh, uh, so this way we have been able to utilize all the three components of uh, this uh, biomass and whatever waste streams are ge uh, uh, generated from all this processing we put together and then that is utilized for cultivation of uh, algal biomass. This biomass is uh, characterized at depending upon its uh, uh, cell wall component at fatty acid component composition, it is further processed to re recover either those fatty acids or the entire biomass uh, is uh, utilized uh, for thermochemical processing to make either biochar or, uh, or bio oil, depends upon. Uh, then we have uh, several collaboration in order to modify those biochar and then utilize those biochar for environmental application, for example, either for soil application or for uh, removal of uh, heavy metals, etc., dyes, etc., from uh, industrial effluent. So, as you can see, that every component is utilized. And then, after algal cultivation, whatever uh, whatever um, wastewater is left out, practically it has a quite low COD. That is how algal biomass cultivation that uh, period. Uh, is decided in order to reduce COD and then depending upon application, either it is utilized for uh, uh, after evaluation of its toxicity, etc. for irrigating the garden or plants uh, uh, or further processed to make it uh, uh, directly disposal in the waste stream. So these are the, some photographs you see about the Pallet plant. This is the line diagram of the same one processing as I mentioned to you. This is a sorghum example is given of a sorghum biomass. And we have developed a nota mixture. It is a patented design for the pretreatment. Again, example is shown as a, uh, a acid pretreatment. It could be alkali treatment. It could be uh, hybrid pretreatment. It could have a firstly microwave assisted treatment uh, thereafter and so on. And then this is uh, how the C5 stream is treated. This is how enzyme is produced. And then C6 stream, which is uh, fermented uh, using uh, 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 Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And then algal biomass, whatever we have, it is cultivated in uh, either open pond or uh, through our collaborator in uh, photobioreactor. And depending upon its algal, uh, biomass composition, primary silver composition, either oil extracted and alcohol oil could be utilized if it is rich in polyunsaturated fats, is it, for example, C18, then it could have nutraceutical values, high value, or otherwise it is utilized for biodiesel. And then lignin, as I mentioned, that it could be utilized for other kind of application, or uh, it can even be burned directly. Currently, the uh, most uh, uh, lignin produced anywhere in such plant or even in uh, other kind of processing plant, it is used directly for burning application as source of uh, energy. 
So co-product and uh, productions are very important as mentioned. So this is an example from one of the industries in Germany and uh, they have been making ethanol from corn. Germany and US are the two countries which make ethanol from corn because their surplus quantities of this uh, uh, corn or maize is available. So they have been producing uh, ethanol, but then the concept of why finally came and in order to continuously improve the process, its efficiency and increase uh, marketability, etc., with economic gain, uh, they looked into process modification and what was done that uh, they brought a very good uh, uh, innovative idea and hydrolyzed it, which was rich in, which was rich in glucose. Uh, Twenty percent of this was utilized for making L lactic acid, and L lactic is obviously is much more priced than ethanol, and. Uh, 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 with the 20% sugar diverted to L lactic acid production, the sale price of ethanol comes down from this price to this price. Uh, the gain was that is from 1.06 uh, used dollar per liter to 0 0.73 uh, dollar per liter. Now, note that this is uh, uh, not necessary to reduce this uh, selling price. It is a competitive price now and also they have economic gain because there are the things not to be revealed but this has become such an important global example to show anybody who works on a by refinery that how profit margins could be improved and how the how the marketability or competition market could be met by diversifying uh, you know, the process and their integration. Again, uh, some examples, what we have, I mentioned to you that we have been working on lysine production and arginine production by a genetically modified cornebacterium glutamicum strain. And this has been very successful, we have patent and uh, we have uh, uh, several collaboration also. So uh, liquid stream, this is how we have been working. We started with all this flask, went to this kind of bottle and then we put uh, this uh, residue pond and we have very unique uh, strain on chlorococcum species because you raise a pond, uh, the, the problem is that you often uh, end up with contamination. But then this species, we have been able to run it for three months experimental trial on this kind of uh, uh, open raise a pond. And we never faced uh, uh, contamination, at least continuously three batches. So this has been quite successful story. So ultimately to sum up, uh, what we can say that solid waste treatment and management needs sustainability as top priority. Resource recovery adds huge sense and value for economic sustainability for developing such treatment processes. Resource recovery and integration of the entire process system must be carried out with greater attention for economic sustainability in a circular economy and co-processing and biorefinery for simultaneous production of validated chemicals and products would be of a great relevance and use for developing sustainable business model. Then uh, advanced biofuel, a specific example since the idea of biofuel. So advanced biofuel produced from non-edible feed stock, solid aggregates are vital option towards uh, resource recovery that is uh, based to energy. So with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Ireshika De Silva to present the token of appreciation to Dr. Samira R. Gunatilaka, who will be accepting it on behalf of Professor Ashok Pandey. Thank you. Dr. Samira R. Gunatilaka is the secretary of FCT 2020 and the honorary editor of the Institute of Chemistry, Ceylon. He has been unfaltering and has worked tirelessly since day one to make today possible. And it is the fruits of his labor that we witness here today. I warmly welcome him on stage to deliver the word of thanks. First of all, thank you, Professor Ashok Pandey, to, uh, for in, uh, accepting our invitation and delivering the keynote address. Honorable dignitaries uh, of the head table, invitees, and participants, good morning to you all. 
I deem it a great honor to propose the word of thanks on this memorable occasion. The International Conference on Frontiers in Chemical Technology was a remarkable endeavor that the Institute of Chemistry, Ceylon, chose to embark. Its initial organizing uh, commended well over a year ago. Uh, remembering this, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to Professor Priyani Parnagama, uh, the president of the Institute of Chemistry, Ceylon, and the chair of FCT 2020 for the leadership and the drive provided towards making this event possible. Even on such short notice, I thank Professor Janita Lienage for gracing FCT 2020 and sharing her valuable expertise with us. I would like to thank the editor in chief of FCT 2020, Professor Kapil Seniviratna for handling the abstract submission and the review process and also the overall con conference proceedings. I thank Dr. A.P. Kirti for his support to reserve the Plastic Institute and also to negotiating with uh, the Independent Workers Association to obtain parking. For their time and wholehearted dedication, I would like to thank the organizing committee members of FCT 2020, namely Dr. Chainika Padumadasa, Dr. Ireshika Di Silva, Dr. Dinusha Odukala, Dr. Medha Gunaratna, Professor Nimal Punisiri, Professor Ragrika Aiganayaka, and um, uh, Mr. NMS head together. Um, on behalf of the organizing committee, I thank the current and previous council for granting us permission to execute this event. Moreover, on behalf of the organizing committee, I thank the international and local advisory committee boards for providing us consultation and guidance on how to execute this event. Next, I acknowledge all our national and international keynote and plenary speakers, top-notch eminent scientists, Professor Ashok Pandey, Professor Subramaniam Sotiswaran, Professor Amelia Pirota, Dr. Sara Thomas, and Professor Neela Kanti Gunawardhana, and all the plenary speakers for their valuable time and commitment. All the researchers who have used their valuable time to submit an abstract to FCT 2020, and to all the reviewers, who admits their busy schedules, agreed to review all the abstracts and submitted for uh, and providing feedback. I thank our professional organizations who have funded this event, such as RSC, Royal Society of Chemistry, International Union of Pure and Applied Chemists, and the National Science Foundation of Sri Lanka. Our corporate sponsors, Windwood Plantations, Senhora Synergies, Microchem, and Link Natural Products, and our personal sponsors for the uh, monetary assistance provided to conduct this event. And I thank the University of Kalania for providing their e-repository to publish the uh, abstracts from FCT 2020 uh, from them to be indexed in the web of science. For providing multimedia and webinar facilities, I thank WebArc for organizing the Women Chemist Forum by gathering eminent female scientists and industrialists. I thank the uh, Women Chemist Committee of the Institute. The Photography Club of IKMC is acknowledged for helping us capture these uh, special moments of FCT 2020. A few months ago, we were very enthusiastic and eager about organizing FCT 2020 in June at the Golf Face Hotel. However, we were planning to bring down these resource persons and presenters from different, part, different parts of worlds to Sri Lanka. Due to unfortunate outbreak of the pandemic, we had to change our plans and uh, resolve to take alternative measures. We were in doubt whether we could accomplish this feat in such short time, namely 20 days. But thanks to my team, we were able to make this event what it is today. At the very onset, I would like to thank my publication officer, Mr. Sahan Singh, for doing all the designings and page layouts of uh, conference proceedings, backdrops, Pandora's, banners, posters, everything. Mr. Chandana Pereira, Hasanta Beratna, and Mr. Sasin for co coordinating the webinar sessions. And uh, special thanks goes to Mr. Hasanta Beratna and his team, including the office staff and supporting staff and cleaning staff for supervising all the overall logistics uh, 
cleaning and safety procedures. Mr. Sahan and Hasanta have never, never let me down in situations in this nature. I must say that, that is nothing impossible with our teaching assistants. Their hard work and remarkable ded dedication and support enables many feats to be accomplished uh, from academic to extracurricular. All the teaching assistants led by Mr. Sashen Ruhnagi for handling major attributes of FCT 2020, such as decorations, refreshments, registrations, ushering, etc. The student council members for assisting with the inauguration ceremony arrangements. I like to thank my project assistant, Ms. Samadhi Navalake, for outstanding organizing skills, emotional stability, and the leadership. For the last 20 days, she didn't look like a project assistant. I felt like I'm working with a matured and seasoned individual. So congratulations, Samadhi. This is your conference. This auditorium uh, may look empty, due to social distancing and uh, seating arrangements. But this is our new normal. The conference is parallelly projected to a different conference hall and also telecast as a webinar to number of registered participants. Also, this is telecast through YouTube and Facebook Live. So the conference is happening at a larger, happening at a much larger scale than what we see here. So, Last but not least, I thank all the participants who are present here physically and joined through webinar links um, despite their troubled times. Thank you once again. With that, we conclude the inauguration ceremony for the FCT 2020. We hope you enjoy and benefit from today's proceedings. Uh, refreshments will now be made available at the ROB hall uh, that is left to my side. Yes, Nach.
Effectiveness of anti-diabetic medication from plants.
Yeah, presentation. Where two to three minutes question and answer is done at the end. For a total of, so the total will be 15 minutes. Huh? Um, 12 to 13 minutes of presentation. Question answer session, two to three minutes. In the presentation, maximum time allocation is 13 minutes. Belling. The first bell will ring once at 10 minutes. The second bell will ring twice at 13 minutes. Then that's all for instructions. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. So I hope you will follow these instructions. Arthonia species collected from mangroves of Sri Lanka will be presented by Shri Sevka and other authors are A. Harmaka, K. Maduranga, R. Veera Singh, K. Pandey, K. Kalia, P. A. Parnagama, A. Kate. So the paper will be presented by Shivka. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon to one and all. Uh, okay. So, myself, I'm a PhD student from uh, Department of Natural Products, National Institute of Education and Research, Ahmedabad, India. And today I will be uh, discussing chemical characterization of endolichenic fungi, Talleromyces phenophilus. Uh, am I audible? Is the screen So I will continue uh, with the flow of my presentation uh, where I will be giving a brief introduction about few terms. Then I will uh, discuss about the objectives which I had come up with and the results which I got and I will give the conclusion of the study along with its future prospect and the references I had gone through. So uh, I will quickly talk about what's lichen, endolichenic fungi, and cancer. So lichen.
Am I audible? Okay. Uh, I take it that I'm audible. Yes, so I will start with myself, Chaitrali Sugar, PhD student from Department of Natural Product, National Institute of Research and Education, Ahmedabad, India. I will be discussing about chemical characterization of endolichenic fungi, Telluromyces phenophilus, residing in the lichen of Arzunia species collected from mangroves of Sri Lanka under the guidance of Dr. Abhijit T.S. Kate. Uh, the flow of my presentation will be, I'll briefly introduce few terms, the objectives I set forward and the results along with the conclusion and the future prospect for the study along with the references I have went through. So quickly, I'll be telling about lichen, endolichenic fungi and cancer. So lichen, these are the dictionary definitions of lichen. It is basically a symbiotic organism uh, wherein a fungi and algae in partnership they grow and it is uh, known as a micro ecosystem because number of microbes reside in and around this lichen species. So endolichenic fungi is one of the fungi which resides into the thalli of the lichen. This term was first coined by Medlikwaska in 2004. So these are very unexplored kind of organisms and uh, it is a lucrative enterprise for understanding its biology as well as making the most of its novel genes with the help of uh, new upcoming technologies of natural products. So I'll, I will also like to highlight a few of the bioactive secondary metabolites from the endolichenic fungi. As you can see, uh, the, these are scaffolds from various different chemical classes, like we can see some terpenes, alkaloids, polyketides, along with uh, they are showing uh, cytotoxic activity, antimicrobial activity, antiviral activity. So this kind of molecules, are uh, they are showing diversity in chemical scaffolds along with uh, bioactivity. So uh, along with this, uh, this is a research which, which has been carried out and has been published in PLOS One, wherein around 70 endolichenic fungi which were inhabiting the lichens collected from the mangrove ecosystem of Sri Lanka have been studied. And these endolichenic fungi have been identified and their extracts had shown, a uh, few of the extracts uh, from Taldenia uh, uh, species had shown the antioxidant uh, activity, radical scavenging activity, along with some antimicrobial activity. Uh, since uh, we are working in collaboration with the authors of this uh, uh, paper uh, and the study has been carried out, uh, we have further uh, taken up this study and we, have, we are trying to chemically characterize the promising extracts out of these endolichenic fungal extracts. So the objective, main objective of these studies were like, we would do the LCMS analysis of the 60 promising endolichenic fungal extracts obtained from the Puttalam lagoons of Sri Lanka. Then uh, we would scale up uh, the uh, scale up of Telluromyces phenophilus extract since this uh, was found to be more uh, potent uh, according to the LCMS analysis and activity data. And uh, then uh, isolation of compounds from this extract along with the activity of the compounds which will be isolated from this extract. So uh, taking into consideration this objective, we proceeded with our study. So while doing the LCMS analysis, we developed the LCMS method and then we analyzed the 60 ethyl acetate crude extracts. And these extracts were from uh, generals like aspergillus, uh, telluromyces, pompsis, 
Sirena, Trichoderma, Zaleria, Daldenia, uh, as mentioned. And uh, uh, this gradient method was used so as to identify a uh, maximum number of peaks and compounds associated with these peaks. And on the basis of the chromatograms which we observed, we grouped these into various priorities. So for prioritizing the extract, we prioritized them into three categories. Priority one, wherein we could see prominent single peak or cluster of intense peaks, which were quite separable as shown in figure one. Uh, priority two, where there were five to seven peaks uh, with intermittent intensity and they were quite separable. So this kind of extracts were prioritized under second category. And the last uh, category was of those extracts which showed more number of peaks and uh, are uh, quite uh, re relatively quite tedious for separation purpose. So uh, according to its uh, uh, easy separation of compounds, we have prioritized the uh, extracts along with that. Uh, this is how we have prioritized in the flow. This gives a flow chart. And along with that, we have done the in vitro anti-cancer activity uh, on MCF7 cell line. So uh, from priority one out of the four ELF, which were prioritized under priority one, Thaleromyces phenophilus extract uh, showed uh, in vitro anti-cancer activity with an IC50 value of 50.32 microgram per ml. And uh, we then uh, did its de-replication of compounds, uh, which was uh, observed, which, whose masses were observed in uh, LCMS uh, data uh, with the help of dictionary of natural product. So we were able to dereplicate two molecules, thaleromine B and 15G25 alpha. So along with that, there are a few uh, masses like 800, 401, uh, 342, which we could not dereplicate with the help of dictionary of natural product. So we decided to scale up this extract so as to so as uh, so as there were a lot of chances and opportunities to end up with novel molecules. So we uh, scaled up to, to 900 mg and i would sincerely like to acknowledge mrs ramani virasinghe from the university of kelania sri lanka for the preparation of above extract so we went on for isolation using normal phase open column chromatographic technique and uh, we loaded around 820 mg of the above mentioned extract and then we collected the fraction using a uh, gradient mobile phase of hexane and ethyl acetate wherein we started from 100% hexane up to 100% ethyl acetate. Below are a few of the TLCs uh, of the promising fractions which have been optimized. I would like to acknowledge Ms. Ashwini Armarkar for this study. Uh, after the column chromatography, we selected a uh, fraction uh, which were 6% ethyl acetate hexane, 60% and 70% uh, because uh, they were showing uh, as shown in the TLC uh, single or two to three spots which were which we can now separate using further chromatographic techniques. So this was the quantity obtained. So now uh, we developed, with, we went on with the higher quantity. So for 70% uh, of the ethyl acetate hexane fraction, we developed a semi-preparative HPLC method and injected the uh, 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 mixture of the compounds. And then we could collect three peaks uh, after the semi-preparative analysis. And this was the yield which we got at the end of that analysis. A uh, similar kind of study was done for the 60% ethyl acetate hexane fraction. So at uh, different retention time, as you can see, 9 retention uh, time, 10 and 12, we uh, could uh, uh, get uh, three different peaks, uh, uh, intense peaks, and we collected those peaks. And this is the yield, which is mentioned in the below table for each of the fraction. So HPLC uh, analysis of this uh, collected peaks was carried out. And according to HPLC, the fraction collected at seven retention time and at 15 retention time uh, was uh, pure, was showing pure uh, pure value pure purity of around uh, 95 percent. But that collected at 14th retention time was uh, comparatively showing two peaks, and hence uh, we had to further purify that. Uh, also, the later uh, three peaks we collected from 60 percent ethyl acetate hexane fraction. Out of that 12 retention time uh, showed a purity of 
94% and that at, eluted at 9 retention time and 10 retention time were uh, showing again the presence of two peaks which again need to further purification. So those three compounds which were showing purity, we went on for its NMR analysis. So we did the NMR, and after we get the, got the NMR spectra, we did the 1D and 2D experiments and we compared the data with the reported um, uh, data. And uh, what we got is the, this uh, peak, which was eluted at seven retention time, showed the same NMR spectra as that of peniazoline B. And this compound was isolated from the soil fungus penicillin species and also from Taleromyces thalidiensis, but it was not reported from Taleromyces spinophilus species as such. Similarly, for the peak which was eluted at 15 retention time, the 1D and 2D NMR experiments were carried out and its data was compared with the reported molecule and it, it was uh, seen, uh, found to be similar to the molecule uh, 1522G256α1, which was isolated from marine fungus Hypoxylon oceanicum and Taleromyces flavus. Here also, this molecule is not reported from Taleromyces pinophilus species. Coming to the third and the last pure, pure, pure compound which we isolated, Again, the similar NMR studies were conf uh, done and the structure was confirmed as ES2423. Again, it was a known molecule uh, which was isolated from the insect pathogenic fungus Cordyceps pseudomilitiaris, but this is not reported from Taleromyces spinophilus. So overall conclusion of the study carried out was LCMS analysis showed the presence of few novel compounds in the endolichenic fungal extracts Chemical characterization of Taleromyces spinophilus lead to dereplication de of few known molecules along with few novel compounds. Although the peniazolin B and 152G256α1 uh, are reported from Taleromyces genus, it has been first time reported from the species of Taleromyces spinophilus. ES2423 molecule was first time reported from Taleromyces spinophilus. Along with that, we have those three uh, mixtures of two compounds and we are hoping to end up with few novel molecules with uh, from this genus uh, which is again our future scope where we are going to purify three uh, fractions which we have obtained after the semi preparative HPLC then we are going to do some in vitro toxicity studies in vivo studies for in anti cancer activity and also uh, if the lead molecule is showing a good promising result then we can go for its formulation development these are a few of the references which I have uh, gone through by, for this study. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. This paper is open for discussion. Any questions to ask? Mm -hmm. This paper is open for discussion uh, and two minutes available. Any questions you have? Anything to get explained? Four new compounds have been isolated according to this. Hmm? Anything about the structure? We don't know. Hmm? Do you know anything about the structure of the four new compounds, two new compounds and two known ones? Ma'am, about the structure, anything is known? You have done some NMR? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so uh, the, these these are the 
scaffolds which are uh, uh, the is my uh, is my presentation can you see my presentation sorry no nothing to show huh yes she has slides and do you have any slides to show on the on side can't expand this retention time also was found to be a known factor that is a peniazepine b but it was first time reported in cases of uh, tyrosomyces similarly a can compound a molecule but it was a uh, first time reported in tyrosomyces pinophilus uh, so this is a uh, and uh, it is about the no new compound but uh, after doing the semi preparation uh, the practice at 9 retention time and 10 retention time uh, so this compounds are, uh, there is a two peaks uh, which are which we obtained out and we are further uh, preparative tl optimize that for purification of this molecule and uh, we uh, so as soon as they are separated we are going to do its nmr study and we are hoping that they will be a novel molecule because uh, in the lcm study of the extract there were few masses which we couldn't de replicate with the help of dnp so there are around uh, two peaks in uh, nine retention time and two peaks at 14 retention time so they 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 these are the four compounds and uh, along with that uh, at uh, um, uh, 10 retention time uh, there is a small peak along with one intense peak so uh, this is also one of the molecule which is yet to be identified and the study is going on along with uh, for this molecules and the other three molecules were the known molecules but it had been uh, for first time reported in the this species uh, telluromyces pinophilus what is the structure of the molecule which is active you say you no know, one is active out of the four out of those four structures this molecule is, uh, showing a anti cancer cytotoxic effect on mcf7 cell line but uh, i have to also study it on mcf10a its normal cell line uh, for further commenting about this molecule any other questions no one minute is gone okay then thank you very much for participating and it is interesting it is a joint project between sri lanka university of kannanaya and this uh, uh, with you 
so hopefully we wish you all the very best to get better results okay thank you thank you for providing such a good platform thank you very much ID eighteen, ID eighteen. So next one uh, number is ID eighteen, subchronic oral toxicity assessment of the leaf extract of Asparagus falcatus in Vistarax. Uh, AMS Samarasiri, AP Athanayaka, KPW Jatilaka, LKV Madhuva. Presented by AMSS Amrasiri. Thank you, madam. Good afternoon, everybody. My topic is my topic is subchronic oral toxicity assessment of leaf extracts of asparagus falcatus in Vista rats. As you all know, there is a revival of interest in medicinal plants nowadays. Since medicinal plants contain bioactive compounds with various pharmacological properties, they are considered as a valuable source of knowledge for modern medicine. Even though a number of medicinal plants have been detailed in Sri Lankan traditional pharmacopoeias in the management of kidney diseases, most of them have not been scientifically evaluated for their safety. Asparagus falcatus, commonly known as Hathawaria, is one such medicinal plant of family Asparagaceae and is widely used in the management of kidney diseases in Sri Lanka. So, the objective of the present study was to evaluate the subchronic oral toxicity of the hexane, ethyl acetate, butanol, and aqueous leaf extracts of asparagus falcatus in Vista Rex. Leaves of asparagus falcatus collected from the southern region of Sri Lanka were used in the study. The botanical identity of the plant was confirmed by comparing with the authentic samples at the National Herbarium Royal Botanical Gardens, Peradeniya. Cleaned, dried, coarsely powdered plant material were sequentially extracted with hexane, ethyl acetate, butanol and water by Soxlet extraction method. The solvents in hexane, ethyl acetate and butanol extracts were evaporated under reduced pressure by rotary operator and then vacuum dried. Concentrated aqueous extracts were freeze dried to obtain the lyophilized powder of the plant material. Extracted plant material were dissolved in the relevant vehicle for the preparation of the equivalent human therapeutic dose in rats. Toxicological evaluation of the selected plant extracts were carried out in healthy male and female Vista rats purchased from Medical Research Institute, Colombo. The animals were housed in standard environmental conditions at the Animal House, Faculty of Medicine, University of Ruhuna. They were maintained on a standard laboratory diet of pellets with free access to water. Ethical clearance was obtained from the Ethics Review Committee, Faculty of Medicine, University of Ruhuna. Experimental animals were randomly divided into seven groups, each with six rats. First three groups served as healthy control and the vehicles respectively, corn oil, 
and polyvinyl pyrolidone were used as the vehicles. Group 4 to 7 were test groups and the experimental animals were treated with hexane, ethyl acetate, butanol and aqueous extracts of asparagus ficatus leaves orally at the equivalent human therapeutic dose in rats. The treatment, treatments were continued for 28 consecutive days as a single dose and the animals were sacrificed on the 28th day of the study. Blood samples were collected by cardiac puncture for the assessment of selected biochemical and hematological parameters. Heart, lung, small intestine, liver, spleen and kidney tissues were excised from the sacrificed animals for the assessment of relative weight of organs and histopathology on HNE stained sections. Measurement of body weight, consumption of food and intake of water were done daily during the study period. Blood samples collected were used for the assessment of biochemical parameters including serum concentrations of creatinine, total protein, blood urea nitrogen, fasting glucose, total cholesterol, high density cholesterol, triglycerides, alanine aminotransferase, aspartate aminotransferase, alkaline phosphatase, and gamma glutamyl transpeptidases by spectrophotometric assay methods. Full blood count testing was performed using the automated hematology analyzer for the assessment of hematological parameters. Assessment of relative weight of organs and histology on HNE stained sections was done on the body tissues collected. The results were evaluated by one way ANOVA, followed by Dunnett's post hoc test for multiple comparisons using SPSS software. P values less than 0 0.05 were considered as statistically significant. The results were satisfactory. Daily administration of the selected plant extracts for 28 consecutive days did not induce mortality in either group of experimental rats. Further, no significant changes in the general behavior or major physiological activities was observed throughout the study period. No significant changes in the body weight, consumption of food and intake of water was seen in the experimental animals treated with plant extracts compared to the untreated healthy control group. This graph shows the evolution of body weight of the different groups of experimental rats used in the study. Kidney and liver serves as the first organs to show toxic effects when they are exposed to potential toxic substances since those organs are primarily involved in the detoxification process. So in the present study, renal toxicity was assessed by means of serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen. Both parameters showed comparable results in the experimental rats treated with plant extracts compared to the untreated healthy control group. So the present findings rule out the potential renal toxicity of the selected plant extracts of asparagus palcators. Liver toxicity was assessed by means of total protein, aspartate aminotransferase, alanine aminotransferase, alkaline phosphatase, and gamma glutamyl transpeptidases in the present study. As you see, even though a significant, statistically significant difference was observed with the aqueous extract of asparagus falcators, the differences were not considered as clinically significant since the values were within the normal physiological range for the species. Fasting serum glucose and lipid profile parameters were estimated in the present study for the assessment of metabolic status in relation to carbohydrate and lipid metabolism. The results showed no significant changes in the experimental rats treated with plant extracts compared to the untreated healthy control group. The significant differences observed with the rats treated with the ethyl acetate extract for 
asparagus facetus was also considered not due to the toxicity of plant extracts since the values were within the normal physiological range for the species the hematopoietic system is one of the most sensitive targets of the toxic substances and it serves an, as an important index of pathological and physiological status of both animals and humans so assessment of food blood, food blood count parameters showed there's no significant changes in the experimental rats treated with plant extracts compared to the untreated healthy control group even though a significant elevation in the hemoglobin concentration was observed with the hexane extract of asparagus falcatus the values were within the normal physiological range for the species similarly relative weight of organs or the organ to body weight ratio is commonly used as an important index in the toxicological studies the results showed there is no statistically significant differences in the relative weight of organs with respect to the vital organs collected in the experimental rats treated with plant extracts compared to the untreated healthy control group the histological findings also corroborated the results of biochemical parameters findings uh, hne stained sections of heart liver small intestine spleen and kidney shows normal morphological architecture no signs of hemorrhages necrosis or inflammatory infiltrations was observed so the results revealed that the treatment with plant extracts caused did not cause any detrimental changes or morphological disturbances to the experimental rats or to their vital organs these are photomicrographs from the experimental rats of healthy control and the two vehicle groups uh, these photomicrographs represent the normal morphological architecture of kidney and liver tissues these are the photomicrographs of experimental rats treated with hexane ethyl acetate butanol and aqueous extracts of asparagus falcatus so the results of the present study revealed that oral administration of the selected extracts of asparagus falcatus at the therapeutic dose for 28 consecutive days to vista rats was toxicologically safe in vivo further these findings claim the traditional use of asparagus falcatus in the treatment of variety of diseases in sri lanka these are my references i would like to acknowledge mr g h m priyashant department of biochemistry faculty of medicine university of ruhuna for the technical assistance provided during animal experiments and also the nsf competitive research grant and the ugc block grant for strengthening research for the financial assistance provided thank you yes madam yes yes madam it is used in the decoctions yes madam
Yes, my name. Yes, madam. This is the initial part of my detailed investigation on the nephroprotective activity of asparagus facator. Yes, madam. I have done the detailed investigation of the nephroprotective activity as well as the mechanisms of nephroprotection as well. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And I did ninety seven. Next paper is on in silico design peptide base AKT inhibitors to induce apostosis in cancer cell. Uh, D. Asanka, C. Ratnavira, L. Vira Singh, presented by A. Asanka. Uh, very good afternoon. I'm Dushana Sanka, and uh, today my topic is in silico design of peptide based AKT inhibitors to induce apoptosis in cancerous cells. So, my first question what is AKT? Uh, basically, you can define AKT as uh, protein kinase B, which has uh, three major isoforms, uh, which are AKT1, AKT2, and AKT3. Uh, AKT1 is the most uh, activated isoform am among these three. Isoform, so our study was restricted only for the AKT1. So this AKT plays major role in uh, regulating cellular functions like cell survival, cell growth, uh, glucose metabolism, as well as many cellular functions. Uh, when considering the structure of uh, AKT, it has uh, three major domains. First, uh, plaque resting homology domain, which is abbreviated as PH domain. Uh, then we have uh, kinase domain. In between that, there's a, a small portion called linker, which linker, uh, which bridge those two uh, domains. And at the very end, we have a hydrophobic motif. So the, this is a brief uh, introduction for the uh, domains. In first, uh, like resting homology domain, it has uh, 100 amino acids. And the major function of this uh, domain is to bring an enzyme to the uh, cell membrane uh, by binding uh, directly to the phospholipids. Uh, in kinase domain, which is also known as catalytic domain, uh, also containing uh, 260 amino acids with uh, several loops like uh, seven alpha helix, nine beta strands, and uh, many other numerous loops. In uh, hydrophobic motif, uh, it contains uh, 60 uh, hydrophobic amino acids residues including the uh, serine, uh, serine 473 uh, regulatory residue. The next thing, why we have selected peptide? Because peptide, there's a current trend to use this peptide as a, a drug lead because it is still unexplored area and very novel method. From the uh, 20 standard amino acid residues, you can prepare several, I mean, billion, billions of billions peptide sequences. And the major thing is peptides are uh, less toxic and 
easily synthesizable and it has high reliability. Uh, my research objective is to identify the potential peptide uh, based AKT inhibitor or the peptide candidates that can be used as drug lead uh, to inhibit the phosphorylation. Moving on to the computer-aided drug discovery, first in homology domain, homology modeling uh, using protein data bank server, PDB ID of 3096 was uh, retrieved and it was analyzed from uh, Notepad++ and then missing residues were identified. Uh, performing a protein blast uh, using the MCBI uh, blast server, the missing residues templates were obtained and using modeler software, those obtained missing residues were added. In this figure, you can clearly see there are the missing residue regions are present. So, for example, uh, alpha carbon helix was missed in the region of uh, uh, lysine 189 to glutamate uh, 198 region. So it was added uh, firstly, and then other missing loops were added uh, subsequently. In the next figure, you can see how the miss uh, after add addition of the missing residues. Uh, after the addition of the missing residues. So after uh, modeling the protein, uh, then the protein was subject to a, subjected to a uh, pro, uh, molecular dynamic simulation uh, using the AMBER-16 suit. Uh, in there, protein was, protein was equilibrated for 100 nanoseconds, and then the production was carried out for another 100 nanoseconds under the NVT conditions. After obtaining the uh, RMSD plot, in there you can see there's a horizontal horizontal portion, which means our model protein was stabilized, which indicates that that our model protein is appropriate for the further docking studies. And this is how the uh, protein was looks looks like uh, after the uh, equilibrated structure. I mean. Uh, the, after the MD, how the protein looks like. Uh, Pre-treatment for the ligand, uh, since uh, this ligand is very novel ligand, uh, novel peptide, so we have to model this uh, ligand uh, using the amber force fields in the uh, amber 16 suit, and it was minimized. Uh, uh, yeah, it was minimized also with the uh, amber, amber force field uh, using the molecular mechanics. For for the uh, to to get more accuracy, why to to get more accuracy, uh, this uh, ligand was again minimized uh, using Spartan protein software uh, uh, with the levels of uh, Hartree-Fock. In docking st studies, first uh, through the literature analysis, I have found the found the binding site of the protein and using Gall software, the peptide ligand was docked into the protein uh, using the scoring function of Gall score, which is uh, unique to the uh, protein peptide docking. In this picture, you can see the, the binding cavity of the protein and ligand was project inwards to that cavity and uh, bind tightly there. Uh, residue was projected inwards uh, to the protein and the lysine residue which is uh, indicated in uh, red color was projected outwards to the protein. In this figure you can see this protein was lying on the uh, in the uh, halo region. So that is the that is the uh, binding site was located inside the protein. For the pro protein peptide complex, uh, again we we did a, I did a MD simulation. Uh, in there, uh, it was protein was uh, complex was uh, equilibrated for uh, 50 picoseconds under NPT conditions, and uh, production was carried out for another 150 nanoseconds. Okay, uh, in this RMSD plot, again you can see the horizontal portion. It means 
chain that indicates that the protein peptide complex was stable. Also, you can see the ligand for the ligand. It is it has also a, a horizontal portion, which means against the ligand also stable uh, over the period of uh, 110 to 150 nanoseconds. And this is the interaction diagrams. Uh, after carrying out the MD, uh, we have uh, taken this uh, from the Discovery Studios. So there are there are uh, so many interactions, but we have especially we have uh, take our consideration on for the hydrogen bonding analysis. So in this picture, you can see uh, there are four major hydrogen bonds uh, in, in this uh, ribbon like structure indicates. Uh, the peptide and the last uh, residue of the peptide was indicated by this. Uh, the last residue of the peptide indicated this thick, thick, like molecule, uh, and these are the residues which are the major bodies. So you can see there are four major hydrogen bodies there. In a protein, there's an active site uh, which uh, the lichen can binds there. So in, I mean, the active site means the uh, in inside protein, uh, the lichen can binds to there only on on there, madam. Uh, like. Uh, yeah, correct. Uh, in this protein, madam, there are several active sites. Uh, now we have used peptides. So peptides can bind to uh, another active site. And the, uh, like uh, if you consider a very small uh, organic ligand, 
that can bind to uh, another active site. I mean, in one protein, it can have uh, has uh, several active sites. So in here, I have identified uh, the active site which can bind the peptide. Binding site. No, no, no. Just the binding site other than the active site. Uh, how would I identify it? Yes, it is the other than the active site. So, the allosteric site means the site other than the active site. Thank you. Vikanayaka will be presented by WGD Vikramasingham. Good afternoon to all. Hope, hope you can hear me. Good afternoon. Yes, you can hear me. I'm Delusha Vikram Singh from University of Peradeniya. Today my presentation is based on determination of antibacterial activity of 6 beta hydroxybutyric acid, which is a naturally isolated calcium. Excuse me, ma'am. Can you share the screen, please? First of all, I would like to pay your attention on why we need to be with different mode of action to treat antibacterial infection. However, when we take antibiotics, most of the bacteria get damaged, but they are very, they are very few amounts can survive without any effect. They are called antibiotic resistant bacteria. Misuse or prolonged use of antibiotics promote these resistant bacteria to grow and multiply. Then the available antibiotics are no longer effective to kill these Hence, Hello. 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 Now, can you see the slide? Yes. Mr. 
Okay. 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 First of all, I would like to pay your attention on why we need new antibiotics. As you know, there are several antibiotics are available with different mode of actions to treat antibacterial infection. However, when we take antibiotics, most of the bacteria get damaged, but there are very few amount can be survived without any effect. They are called antibiotic resistant bacteria. Misuse or prolonged use of antibiotics promote these resistant bacteria to grow and multiply. Then the available antibiotics are no longer effective to kill these resistant organisms. Hence, we need new antibiotics. Therefore, scientists are continuously striving to find new antibiotics to combat with these resistant organisms. On the other hand, plants produce secondary metabolites. As Pixie describes, they can be classified into several chemical classes such as tannins, alkaloids, flavonoids, glycosides, and cyclohexanes. Even though plants produce these secondary metabolites, they are not involved with the primary growth of the plant. Plants purposely produce them to survive from the environmental attacks such as insects, fungicides, nematocytes, as shown here. Therefore, we can believe that the secondary metabolites have promising bioactivity, which can be effectively taken as antibiotic lead compounds. In addition to the presence of promising bioactivity, plants produce secondary metabolites have several other advantages, such as complex structure, structural diversity, metabolic stability, low cost, and the low toxicity. With that, I will move on to the six um, with hydroxybutyric acid, which is we are working with. This is the structure of six with hydroxybutyric acid. Uh, this is uh, this is a plant or a secondary metabolic come under leucine triterpenoid. There are a few reasons for selecting this compound for our study. One is it is isolated from Sumatria castanifolia, which is endemic plant to Sri Lanka. Another reason is it is structurally similar to well-known triterpenoid butylenic acid, which has been reported to possess several bioactivities. Another reason is one of our senior students in our research group has identified unreported antibacterial activity of this uh, compound against Staphylococcus aureus. So uh, the first objective of of our research was determination of the antibacterial activity of 6 beta hydroxybutyric acid against representative gram positive and gram negative organisms. Here we tested uh, against three standard strains of gram positive bacteria, including Staphylococcus aureus, and four standard strains of gram negative bacteria, including E. coli. In addition, four strains of clinically isolated methicillin resistant Staph aureus and four strains of clinically isolated meropenem resistant Acinobacter species. For this test, we used the broth microdilution method. Results reveal that 6 beta hydroxybutyric acid showed antibacterial activity against gram positive organisms. These are the observed MIC values of 6 beta hydroxybutyric acid against each gram positive organ. However, this compound was inactive against all the tested gram negative bacteria for the tested concentration rate. Then the second objective was determination of the synergistic effect of 6 beta hydroxybutyric acid with oxycillin against standard strains of Staphylococcus aureus and four strains of methicillin resistant staph aureus. For this, we have uh, used the checkerboard method. In this column, we tabulate the MIC values observed of 6 beta hydroxybutyric acid and oxycillin alone and when they are combined. Then we calculate the fractional inhibition concentrations and by that get the FIC index. According to the synergistic effect interpretation, 
बैक्टीरिया then the 6 beta hydroxybutyric has synergistic effect with oxycycline against staphylococcus and additive effect with against all the tested mrs thank you
all the species. Uh, two compounds has been extracted, uh, showing anti-cancerous, anti-inflammatory, and antioxidant activity. So, uh, let us see what the OSMAC approach is. OSMAC stands for Warm Strain Many Compounds. So, on the normal laboratory culture condition, a substantial factor, secondary metabolite is producing gene clusters of microorganisms strain and dominant. So, scientists use some uh, expensive and complicated methods in order to activate this gene. So, using the OSMAC approach, we can achieve uh, this results in So, uh, in Osmac approach, what we do is we systematically vary the culture parameters such as pH, elevation, temperature, or the culture media height uh, in order to diversify the better uh, metabolite produced by the single strain of fungus and also uh, in order to increase, uh, increase the amazement of the carbon platform. Produced from a single uh, other species. Uh, so, the objective of this research was cultivating fungus in different culture areas of potabilism from these products, extracts from dried leaves from wholemeal extracts from and taking the uh, fruit extracts and analyzing whether uh, the composition of uh, their, the fruit extracts are different from each other. And whether their power activities are different. Uh, in order to do that, uh, first we need a small scale culture in solid culture media of PEA, YPEA, RYA, and OEA. So these are the constituents of uh, each of the culture media. And the fungus was uh, incubated when uh, the cultures were incubated for seven days. Uh, using those respective uh, solid media, it was culturally uh, large scale liquid culture mediums. So, out of the uh, liquid culture medium, two plus persons are kept as controls without inoculating the fungus. And this was uh, incubated for seven days. Uh, then uh, we filtered out and extracted uh, the metabolites using. As well as a, and it was subject to rocket aeration, and we obtained the fruit sample. So, the fruit samples obtained were present in different cancers and different colors. Uh, then we uh, analyzed the samples using uh, TLC. So, uh, the, the TLC resulted in showing uh, four different evolution patterns for the four different fruit samples, and it also showed that. There is no compound extracting from the culture media into the ethyl acetate extract. Uh, then, in order to further analyze the fruit samples, we carried out the HPLC. The chromatogram of PDB showed the evolution of two major genes. The chromatogram of YPDB group showed the evolution of uh, four major peaks and two minor peaks. So one of the peaks in uh, YPDP was close in retention time to one of the peaks in PDP. 
The function gamma of power is a short elevation of five meter in this case. Then the function gamma uh, r by is a short elevation of two meter space, which are in cross section back to each other, and uh, it was uh, cross section back to one of the peaks elevated in the field below. Uh, so from the previous gram, uh, we can say that the composition of each of the two samples were different from each other. Then we now to analyze the uh, bioactivities. Uh, first, we carry out the DPPH. So the uh, basis of the DPPH assay is the DPPH radical will lose its uh, characteristic bond color upon reacting with the uh, Compound containing antioxidant activity. The standard methodology was followed when carrying out the assay. Upon analyzing the results of the DPPS uh, assay, the powder sample showed no activity compared to standard butana hydroxyl But when comparing the powder sample, the only thing which showed the highest antioxidant activity. Then we carried out the ADPS assay. Uh, ADPS assay is also an antioxidant assay. The basis of this assay is the ADPS radical reduces its uh, characteristic blue green color upon reacting with the uh, species having antioxidant activity. So, here also we have carried the carry out the assay according to the standard methodology. When comparing the results of the uh, ABGN assay, uh, compared to the DPPH assay, uh, the form sample showed higher uh, antioxidant uh, activities in the ABGS assay. So, here also the highest activity was shown by the OEP group sample. Then we carried out the anti inflammatory assay. So, the basis of the anti inflammatory assay is the cytoxidant enzyme, which is the lysosomal enzyme. Is the production of phosphate lipids, uh, which in turn results in inflammation. So, So the different radioactive membrane uh, is similar to the isothermal membrane. So what we uh, observe here is whether our food sample is able to stabilize the human radioactive membrane. So here also the standard procedure was followed. When comparing the results of the uh, anti-inflammatory assay, the food sample showed no activity compared to the Standard aspirin, but when comparing the hormone uh, sample, the YPTC group showed the higher uh, anti inflammatory activity with the IC which value of 0 0.15 milligrams per milliliter. When we carry out the antibacterial assay using the egg oven diffusion method, the three bacteria species we used were uh, Staphylococcus aureus, Bacillus subtilis, and Escheria aureus. Here also the standard methodology was followed. Uh, the standard we used was azithromycin. Upon analyzing the results of the antibacterial assay, the PDP group did not show any antibacterial activity. Uh, the uh, YPDP group showed the antibacterial activity for the other three bacteria species, but the highest was for the Escheria species. Then we uh, analyze the results of the R Y group. R Y group showed activity for the all the three bacteria species, but the highest was for the subtilis species. Mm -hmm. 
The all of these projects are also shown after you know all the three uh, computers pieces and the highest cost of the SRS thing. Uh, upon analyzing the overall results of the antibacterial assay among the four fruit samples, uh, the R biting fruit showed the higher antibacterial activity. From the above data, we concluded that the endolytic species cellularin thyroid is able to produce different metabolites having different uh, bioactivities when cultured in different culture media. These are my references. I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. P.A. Panagana, Dr. Medha Panagana, Institute of Chemistry and Department of Chemistry, University of Canada, College of Hello. So, madam, basically we utilize a single uh, type, single type of fungus that is Curvillaria trifoli, and we culture that in different culture medias. Okay, then we analyzed uh, it for their bioactivities. So uh, the crew, uh, the culture medias are used for um, potato dextrose broth, yeast potato dextrose broth, oatmeal extract broth, and rice yeast broth. So uh, the highest antioxidant activity was shown by the um, uh, OEB crude, that means oatmeal extract broth crude. Then the highest uh, anti-inflammatory activity by the yeast, uh, sorry, uh, yeast potato dextrose broth. Then the highest uh, antibacterial activity for rice yeast broth. So the fungus is able to produce different metabolites in different culture medias, and they show different bioactivities. That is the basis. Any other questions?
Uh, as a token of appreciation, uh, we would like to call uh, AMNS Amarasim. Uh, as a token of appreciation, we would like to call uh, AMNS Amarasim and B Amanda to receive. Uh, we would like to call uh, AMSS Amarasiri and D. Asanka to receive the token of appreciation. So, thank you very much for participating at this session. So, this concludes uh, the uh, afternoon session. <laughs> uh, after this, tea. Tea, where is the tea? See? Three. Early. Three. Our next session will start at three.
て。
Suryanarayanan. Professor Suryanarayanan is currently working as the director at Vivekananda Institute of Tropical Mycology, uh, Chennai, India. He has obtained his PhD in 1979 from University of Madras. He has been a recipient of many prestigious international awards and he has collaborated with many international and national scientists. Throughout his academic career, he has published around 120 research papers in renowned journals and 13 book chapters. Today, Professor Surya Narayanan uh, presenting his research work. The topic is fungal endophytes a source of novel bioactive secondary metabolites and industrial enzymes. Professor Surya Narayan, uh, you can start your talk. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. So, I'm delighted uh, to give a talk in this uh, international conference. Uh, so, I shall share my PowerPoint screen now. Just a second, let me stop. So, uh, can you see it now? Yeah, can you uh, see uh, the slides or? You can see the screen, but not the slides. You can see the, you can see the as well. Can I go ahead? No, sir, you can't see the PowerPoint presentation. Not seeing the screen. Okay. Uh, uh, let me see. So I'm supposed to share the screen, right? Yeah. Not yet. You can see, sir. You can use this to Okay. Uh, so just wait for a sec minute. I will get this sorted out.
Excuse me, sir. You can start the presentation now. So you can start the presentation now, sir. Can you see the slides? Yes, sir. We can see the slides. Okay. So I don't have to do anything. I can go ahead with my talk, right? So, uh, my talk will be on uh, the uh, possibility of using fungal endophytes to get some novel industrial enzymes. Uh, so, the next half an hour, I would be concentrating on this by citing uh, to the work that has been done in our lab. Uh, and citing some examples. So we all know what fungal endophytes are. They are uh, fungi which colonize the living tissues of plants and uh, they don't produce any disease symptoms. They are common cells or symbionts. They occur in all species of plants which have been screened for them to date. And uh, most of them belong to a group of fungi called the Ascomycetes. And uh, there are many studies which uh, address the production of uh, secondary metabolites, which are bioactive in several ways. Uh, the secondary metabolites of endophytes have been uh, studied to great extent uh, because they produce different types of uh, secondary metabolites, including terpenoids, xanthones, steroids, phenols, and then uh, isocomarins, etc., cytogalazins. And these uh, chemicals exhibit antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, anti-cancer, antioxidant, and uh, other type of very interesting bioactivities. So because of this, the endophytes have been studied in great detail. But then uh, what about these fungi as a source of uh, enzymes? Now, generally, okay, like, Fungi are, as you know, fungi are all uh, uh, eukaryotes exhibiting an absorptive type of nutrition, which means they have to produce enzymes which are secreted out of the cells of the fungi, and which go out and then uh, break down the, the macromolecules which are available as food, and then they absorb the uh, broken molecules and then use them as so they have a good potential to produce different uh, types of enzymes that's why they play a major role in uh, recycling so then when when endophytes have been studied for bioactive compound uh, why cannot they be screened for some industrial enzymes as well so that was the question which we asked when we started this work and uh, because there were very little studies on enzymes from endophytes. So to begin with, we, we looked at our uh, endophyte collection to, for certain enzy enzymes like chitin deacetylase, chitinase, chitosanases, cellulase, xylenase, xylosidase, alkaline protease, acidic proteases, Canase, asparaginase, lacase, and beta glucosidase. Just a very uh, broad and uh, uh, initially the, the screens were all, uh, uh, you know, uh, qualitative. And so we screened a large number of them. In one of our results, when we screened uh, uh, the fungi for lignocellulosic biomass degrading enzymes like cellulase, lacase, etc. We screened 133 fungi. And you see that uh, many of them uh, produced uh, these enzymes, cellulases, lacases, pectinases, and pectin transalivinases. So when we continued our study, we thought some of these enzymes um, could be used for this uh, conversion of biomass to biofuel. Now, the conversion of biomass uh, to biofuel, as you all know, 
is uh, where we we take the uh, uh, you know the the plant biomass which is made up of uh, lignocellulose in the cell wall and then we use them for i mean we we take them as the as a basic material and convert them to biofuel bioethanol for example now the important thing here is um although we say it so easily it's not easily done because the molecules the macromolecules which are from which we can get this bioethanol are the cellulose and hemicellulose microfibrils these uh, are polymers as you know and these polymers which are present in the cell wall are actually covered by lignin which is another polymer and that lignin is a very tough structure and uh, so it hides you can imagine that this lignin coating hides the cellulose and hemicellulose so we need to first you know tear this lignin or partly at least remove this lignin from the biomass and only then we will get in touch with say here you have this the 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 uh the microfibrils the hemicellulose and cellulose microfibrils are here but you have the lignin covering it so if you want to use this for your biofuel production you have to if not completely at least you should partially remove that lignin and then you can go ahead with that so plant biomass the first thing is uh, we have to destructure the plant cell wall to remove or tear lignin to expose the polysaccharides namely the cellulose and the hemicellulose and then you break the hemicellulose and cellulose because they are polymers you break them into simple sugars using uh, enzyme nowadays they use uh, trichoderma uh, fungal fungal enzyme which are they are very efficient and then so they break the polysaccharides to their monomers and then the monomers are converted to ethanol using yeast so the uh, so the, the first uh, exercise in converting lcb lignocellulosic biomass to biofuel is the uh, destructuring of this cell uh, of the lignin and that is done by a method called pretreatment and the pretreatment means you take the biomass that is the plant or and then heat it at 150 degrees celsius uh, in the presence of acid so that it's such a very harsh treatment is necessary to uh, partially remove the lignin or uh, destructure the lignin and then the cellulose and hemicellulose are exposed okay so this pretreatment is important now having said that pretreatment is some must but at the same time it's a problem because when you when you do this in addition to the, the pretreatment in addition to uh, shearing the lignin carrying the lignin it also releases uh, toxic uh, phenolics and also furaldehydes these toxic furaldehydes will inhibit the next process or the downstream process of biofuel production namely they interfere with the enzymes of uh, trichoderma so you have to remove this uh, furaldehyde before you uh, uh, you know de uh, degrade the depolymerize the cellulose and hemicellulose so that increases the cost of biofuel production and also because this is uh, the furaldehydes are toxic it can it causes environmental concerns okay now these furaldehydes are volatile organic compounds and they are released in very large quantities whenever uh, the plant biomass burns we have seen dry <coughs> leaves and twigs when they burn uh, you get a smell and mostly it is due to this uh, furaldehydes so now we ask this question okay we have uh, plants uh, in, in, in in let us say in uh, dry deciduous forest we have trees which have the leaves and on in the leaves you have different uh, species of fungi occurring inside the leaf as endophytes 
and then the leaf matures and then the leaf falls to the ground when it falls to the ground here degradation takes place as you know uh, by litter degrading organisms uh, you know you have bacteria you have fungi <coughs> sorry so you have uh, insects nematodes all come and degrade this uh, now, so the question is, what happens to these endophytic fungi when the leaves fall? Because our definition is endophytic fungi live in living tissues of plants. Okay, that's fine as long as the leaf is living here. But once the leaf falls to the ground, it's a dead leaf. What happens is we have seen that uh, the endophytes disappear, but not all endophyte species disappear. There are some endophytes which survive as endophytes in living leaves and also they continue to survive in the dead leaf after the leaf has fallen then there are no more endophytes they switch over to a saprophytic or saprotrophic mode and they they produce a lot of uh, biomass degrading enzymes like cellulases hemicellulases etc and they digest this uh, biomass here and eat them so for example these fungi so so that's one thing so a fungus can switch its, its uh, lifestyle from endophytic to a totally saprotrophic form and it is capable of producing cell wall degrading enzymes or biomass degrading enzymes. Now the forests which we st uh, studied, they are dry deciduous forests as I mentioned earlier. So what happens here is uh, that the, these forests, they don't receive very much rain. They receive rain only for about two months the two uh, not heavy rains so the rest of the nine to ten months it's all a totally a dry period and toward the end of the dry period all the plants drop their leaf so there is a lot of biomass which occurs in the ground here and then it is very dry and uh, maybe a lightning or even a deliberate fire uh, can cause uh, damage so that you see in these forests there are uh, these forests experience um, um, these forest fires quite often. Then after some, see, the, the fire burns and then all the grasses and then the herbs are all killed. But then um, the plants do not have leaves because the, the, the bark uh, uh, helps them to survive the heat. Um, the plant looks, the, the trees look dead. But and the, after this is all over, the next season will be the rainy season. And once the rains occur, these will start producing buds and new leaves and then the rhizomes of the grasses which were burned, the rhizomes are deep inside the soil so they are not affected by the fire and they will once again regenerate and you see the new forest regeneration. But our question was, what will happen? And then if you go and look at the leaves, you will have the same endophytes here. So the question is, where are the endophytes during the fire season? Where do they survive? I mean, how do they survive? For example, the, the trees survive because the fire because they have the bark which protects them the grasses survive because the upper part of the grass will be destroyed by the fire but below the ground they have the rhizomes which protect them then what about these fungi so we looked at uh, so are, are they having uh, any adaptation uh, to survive the high temperature when when uh, the uh, fire burns of course nothing will survive here but in the margin where the fire is not there, but the heat is very high due to the fire. Uh, do the fungi survive there? And then uh, there's so much of uh, fural dehyde released. Uh, then what about these fungi? If they survive, can they get exposed to fural dehyde because fural dehydes are toxic? So we asked these two questions. And then what we looked at was, uh, we know that these endophytes are mesophilic. They cannot grow at temperatures beyond 50 degrees Celsius or even 45, then how do they tolerate temperatures uh, which are very high? Okay, so we didn't uh, look at the vegetative part of the mycelium of the fungus, but the resting structures of the fungi, of these fungi called the spores, we, when we looked at them, they are able to tolerate exposure to uh, profound heating, although they are mesophilic. Extraordinary thermal resistance was observed. See, some of these fungi, you can expose them to 115 degrees Celsius for two hours, or 110 degrees for two hours, or even 105 degrees for six hours. Spores don't die. 
So that's an adaptation uh, that some of these fungi have developed. And then what about fuuraldehydes? Do they uh, tolerate fuuraldehydes? They not only tolerate, they also use the fuuraldehydes as food, as carbon source. That was amazing because it's generally toxic to most of the fungi. And then when we looked at the, the, the gene sequences of uh, uh, some of these genera, we found that they have uh, genes which govern what is known as the trudgeal pathway, which is present in bacteria, which helps them to uh, catabolize or break down this toxic fuel dehydrate. So it appears that fungi also have this trudgeal pathway, which helps them uh, use toxic fuel dehydrates. Okay. So then we suggested that such fungi, which are uh, which can utilize uh, fuel dehydrates as carbon source, should be used for biofuel production. So here you have the lignocellulose biomass, you pre-treat it with acid and high temperature so that you tear the lignin, but that produces furaldehydes, but, and the furaldehyde inhibit the downstream process. But if you put these fungus here, like alternate area, which we isolated, they can use the furaldehyde here as carbon source, and they can reduce the amount of furaldehyde here by using it as carbon source, they grow, and they also produce cellulitic enzymes. So you have a one pot solution for this and then the sugars can be got and from sugars you can get the biofuel. Okay. Now there is another possibility. Uh, instead of uh, the pretreatment to tear the lignin, you can also use what are known as ionic liquids. These ionic liquids, uh, they are chemicals, small molecules, which can be used to dissolve lignin. So you don't have to pre-treat it. You don't have to put, uh, I mean, put the biomass in, in high acid and high temperature. So there is no problem with the uh, fural dehydes. Okay. So you just put this ionic liquid and the ionic liquid will tear the lignin. Let's imagine that. Way. But there's a problem here. The ionic liquids also denature or inactivate many of the commercially available cellulose. So you may win using ionic liquid for tearing the lignin, but that ionic liquid uh, will not allow your next step to go on, namely cellulases to break down cellulose or hemicellulases to break down hemicellulose to simple sugar. So you need to look for uh, ionic liquid tolerant cellulases and hemicellulases. Are they there? So when we looked at it, yeah, we did see some species of uh, our endophytes, uh, which produces, which produce ionic liquid tolerant enzymes. So it's amazing. Um, you can use this. Uh, it is possible to use this fungi if you are using ionic liquid for uh, pre-treatment to, to tear the lignin, then you don't have to remove the ionic liquid, waste uh, money in that removal process, but even put this trichoderma, which will uh, use this, uh, I mean, which will produce cellulase, which is not affected by the ionic liquid. It is insensitive and you can go ahead and produce your sugars and then the biofuel. So this is again an endophyte. So that is the, uh, you know, scenario when it comes to biofuel production. And it is possible that some endophytes produce some novel enzymes, which may be useful for biofuel production. Okay, now let's go to pharmaceutical enzymes. Do endophytes produce pharmaceutical enzymes? Okay, so here is an example, asparaginase. Asparaginase is an enzyme which breaks down asparagine as the name suggests. Now, that enzyme is used as a, as a medicine against cancer a type of cancer called acute lymphoblastic leukemia or ALL, which affects children. Now, it's interesting because, you know, the, the cancer cells, the ALL cancer cells uh, cannot synthesize uh, asparagine, I mean acid, but the normal cells do. And so the cancer cells, what they do is, 
how do they then survive in the body they depend on the asparagine which is produced by the normal cells the normal cells produce asparagine they use and then the rest of the asparagine is uh, thrown into the blood stream and it circulates in the blood and these cancer cells grab them from the blood and use them so if you can reduce the amount of asparagine amino acid in the blood stream then because the cancer cells are not able to synthesize asparagine asparagine amino acid and because they are not able to get the asparagine from the blood flow because you you have used asparaginase in the blood to re, to remove the asparagine then those uh, cancer cells would die and that's a good way of protecting the children or, or you know trying to uh, help the children that's what they do they inject asparaginase enzyme in the blood stream and what they do is now they depend on bacterial source of the enzyme um but it's it would be nice to have a eukaryotic source of this enzyme because we know as you know we are all eukaryotes and then so if you get a eukaryotic uh, source of the enzyme instead of uh, the currently used bacterial prokaryotic one it will be more compatible with the human system um because now they use bacterial enzyme there are two problems with that one is that enzyme is effective but it can cause side effects so uh for it, it, it so it you know it causes side effects and then um, so that the child has to be monitored continuously all that and another problem is aspar asparaginase is not a very specific enzyme it not only acts on asparagine but also acts on glutamine and another i mean i said so that it's a very funny enzyme it it has two substrates it can when asparagine asparagine is there it will break asparagine but if it sees glutamine it will break glutamine and when it breaks glutamine it produces the products are glutamate and ammonia and ammonia you know is toxic and uh, it can result in uh, uh, neurotoxicity or even kidney damage so the idea would be to find uh yeah a new karyotic source of the enzyme and also an enzyme which will work only on asparagine asparagine and not on glutamine so is there a possibility uh, yeah we looked at endophytes and some endophytes produce uh, asparaginase enzyme which are specific to asparagine and they did not exhibit glutamine as activity so it seems to be a uh, you know a very uh, uh, interesting um, novel enzyme here and then um, uh, there are also chitin modifying enzymes right you know chitin is a polymer of n acetyl glucosamine and uh, you get it in crabs and then uh, uh, <coughs> shrimp and all that it's a polymer and uh, when it is uh, broken down to um, uh, uh, you know uh, smaller pieces of molecules we call them chitosans and they are oligomers and that those chitosan which is got from the chitin is very useful you can use them for crop protection wound healing drug delivery and to treat arthritis etc okay so how it's chitosan is a product this is chitin molecule here n acetyl glucosamine polymer and you, this is the chitosan okay so you remove this group and then this is the chitosan and also the molecule will be shorter chains and then this chitosan can be used as uh, used for wound healing crop protection etc 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 but um, how do we get chitosan from chitin you have to treat chitin with concentrated sodium hydroxide uh, for a long time at least 3 hours or more that alkaline alkali treatment will break the uh, Will will convert chitin to chitosans. Now, I said that chitosan uh, are shorter chains, and uh, they are glucosamine polymers. Uh, the N acetyl is gone here from chitin, and this is useful for used as uh, for in in many applications like crop protection, wound healing. But you know, imagine a chitosan of so many. Uh, 
uh, monomers, glucosamine, say about 200 glucosamine monomer. That can be used for wound healing. I'm just giving you a rough, uh, it's not a correct example. But if you get a, a, a chitosan of a shorter length, then you can use it for arthritis. So what I want to say is, when you treat chitin to get chitosan, when you treat chitin with the, this uh, uh, sodium hydroxide for, for three or four hours and you get chitosan, they are not of equal length. They differ in their length, which means they also differ in their property. So you get a you get a mixture of different types of chitosans by this method, and there how much of deacetylation is there? The acetyl degree of deacetylation is also not standard here. It can be anywhere between what fifty to fifty five percent. So you get um, chitosans of different uh, lengths and chitosans having different degrees of uh, acetylation, which means they differ in the property. So you have to then separate them based on whatever molecular weight or something. Uh, that's a tough job. And it, so it increases the cost. And also, this is not an environmentally friendly method, you would agree with me, because you are using a lot of sodium hydroxide. To do. So instead of that, if you break chitin uh, to chitosan and then break chitosan to smaller uh, polymers of a particular length, you can do that by using enzymes um, so specific chitosans can be got of particular tailor-made length. And then the, that method would also be environmentally friendly. So you look for enzymes uh, called chitosanase, which are a class of enzymes used to generate defined oligomers from chitosan polymers. So you avoid sodium hydroxide treatment. This is an environmentally friendly method using chitosanase enzymes. Second thing is you get as end products uh, defined oligomers of chitosan having particular length and having a particular degree of acetylation so you can purify and use them straight away. So where do you get this uh, chitosanases? And fungi have chitin in the cell wall and so they need to produce chitinases and chitosanases when they grow, when they produce branches, when they produce spores. So it's good to screen fungi for chitin modifying enzymes. And uh, we thought, why don't we look at endophytes? So we screened uh, 160 or something like 62 isolates uh, for chitin modifying enzymes. Out of it, 31 of them produce chitinases. And uh, different uh, of these 31 isolates, different isolates produce different isoforms of chitinase. Many isolates produce chitosanases. Okay, which acted on uh, chitosans of different degrees of acetylation. So you can get a variety of enzymes uh, uh, or uh, modified chitin products by using uh, this uh, cocktail of enzymes from uh, endophytes. And so you could you could then think. Uh, so the question is the basic question is: Are endophytes uh, present in plants? Do they also help in the defense of the plant against pathogens and pests? Because, you know, insect pests are there and fungal pathogens are there. Both have chitin walls, chitin exoskeleton for insects and chitin cell wall for pathogenic fungi. So whether these endophytes also produce uh, certain uh, chitin modifying enzymes when they are actually present within the plant and do these chitin modifying enzymes fight uh, and protect the plant, uh, right, uh, you know, against... Uh, infection by pathogenic fungi or infestation by insect uh, pathogens, insect parasites that need to be discerned. So here you can see uh, chitosanases or endophytic fungi, sordaria, pestilosiops, spitomyces, oreobasidium, many of them producing different uh, uh, chitosanases. You can, you can uh, add different uh, chitosans of different uh, deacetyl, uh, I mean, acetylation percentage, and then use these enzymes to see how specific they are. Here, you, you see, you isolated uh, an endophytic fungus from the mangrove uh, plant. And then, as you know, mangroves um, also always come in contact with seawater. So uh, these, these endophytes are, are uh, uh, you know, they, they are protected they have some mechanism by which they can survive in high concentrations of sodium chloride. 
So we tried, okay, what will be the chitinase? What will be the chitinase enzyme uh, spectrum when the fungus is grown in sodium chloride or salt medium? So here you see, this is zero salt. You see the, the pattern here, uh, isoforms of uh, uh, chitosanase. And the same fungus, when it is grown in a medium of having 1.5% uh, sodium chloride, you see the more isozymes are formed. So the same fungus, growth conditions can, you can vary the growth conditions and then screen so that you can actually see if it produces different types of uh, uh, enzymes. So I'm coming to my last slide. Uh, um, you know that fungi are extraordinarily species rich. Their estimate is uh, 1.5 million species. Even this is not, uh, now this is contested. They say there are around 3.5 million species of fungi. Although we know only about 7% uh, uh, of these fungi. So we have so many species. But you see, for 60% um, of the fungal enzymes which are used in industries, come from just these five genera, Aspergillus, Humicola, Penicillium, Rhizopus, and Cricoderm. But you see 1.5 million species are estimated. At least we have now, let's say in India, we have, let's say 23,000 species of fungi. So we can uh, see, we can screen, uh, say, endophytes from plants of different ecological niches. Say, for example, you can, you can uh, 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 isolate endophytes from plants which are growing in, in, uh, in uh, you know, where uh, the temperature is low from a, from a uh, high peaks, uh, the Himalayan range where there is uh, temperature is very low. And then see these fungi produce uh, uh, cold tolerant enzymes. So there's a lot of scope for looking at, uh, I mean, for a lot of scope uh, with reference to industrial enzymes from endophytic fungi. So that's uh, my talk. And uh, so I hope uh, I uh, have uh, sort of uh, anchored your interest on uh, studying endophytic fungi from plants of different ecological niches for uh, an industrial enzymes, um, because there are very few studies on this, although many studies have been there, have been conducted on, on uh, secondary metabolites of uh, End of fights. So with this, uh, I come to the end of my talk. Uh, uh, my sincere thanks are due to senior professor, Mrs. Uh, Parnagama for inviting me to give this talk, in this uh, ex wonderfully organized conference. And I thank my students, collaborators, and Swami Shukadevananda, secretary of this uh, Ramakrishna Mission Vidya Pit, where I work, for all the support given to me throughout my scientific career. And uh, thank you all for listening to me. Yeah, if there are any questions, I'll be glad to answer if there is time. Thank you, Professor Surya Narayanan. Now the session is open for questions. Okay. In the absence of uh, questions, uh, we would like to uh, thank Professor Surya Narayanan as a, a token of appreciation. Uh, we would like to give you a, a plug and we will send it to you soon. Uh, thank you, sir. Oh, excellent. I'll be very happy to receive that. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that uh, uh, all of you were able to hear me and see my slides. Yes, sir. Okay, excellent. excellent. Before we start Sultan Bhava Award presentations, I would like to give some instructions uh, for presenters. Presenters are only allowed to uh, sit on the allocated stations. Masks are mandatory to wear, all, uh, wear at all times. Presenters allowed to 
remove their masks when presenting. If you are removing your mask, we advise you to remove it completely. After each presentation, the surfaces including podium, microphone and the pointer will be disinfected. Each talk is designed for 15 minutes. Therefore, each presenter is allowed 12 to 13 minutes for their presentation, where two, three minutes question and answer is done at the end for a total of 15 minutes. In the presentation, the maximum time allocation is 13 minutes. The first bell will ring once at 10 minutes. The second bell will ring twice at 13 minutes. So I would like to invite our uh, first uh, Sultan Bava Award presentation uh, presenter. Okay. So before that, I would like to uh, introduce the uh, panel, Sultan Bava Award uh, panel. So Professor MUA Sultan Bava Award for Research in Chemistry. Uh, the panel is Professor Priyani Paranagama, Dr. Lakshmi uh, Arambevela, Professor Chamari Hetiarachi, Professor Ramani Vijayse. Professor Nimanti Chayatilaka and Dr. Shainika Padimadasa. Our next speaker is KHTP Kubara Singha, abstract number 13, antibacterial cytocalacin B from endophytic. Curvularia lunata isolated from Cyprus area of Sri Lanka. Other uh, authors are T. Pavala Kant Rasa, J. M. N. M. Jai Sundara, and P. B. Ratnavira. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. I am here to present our research, Antibacterial Cytocalacin B from Endophytic Curvularia Lunata, isolated from Cyprus area of Sri Lanka. Uh, first of all, I am going to give you a brief introduction about our research. Uh, for that, you have to be familiar with the word antibiotics. Antibiotics are a group of drugs that used to kill bacteria. And uh, most antibiotics uh, have, uh, have been developed by the compounds isolated from the bacteria and fungi. Uh, Drug-resistant bacteria and fungi are increasing rapidly and it has become a serious health problem in the world. Uh, main reason for that is resistance, for this resistance is overusage and misusage of antibiotics and uh, taking antibiotics when they are not needed accelerate the emergence of antibiotic resistance. Uh, when bacteria become resistant to antibiotics, common infections become no longer treatable. Uh, when it comes to my research problem, as I mentioned earlier, majority of pathogenic bacteria have uh, developed their resistivity uh, to the existing antibiotics. Uh, therefore, 
we have to innovate novel antibiotics to substitute the existing ones. So new antibacterial compounds should be isolated for that. Researchers have been found that endophytic fungi of Sri Lanka is a relatively novel and tapped resource for the isolation of new antibacterial compounds. Endophytic fungi are a diverse and useful group of microorganisms that live inside the healthy tissues of the plants and they maintain a symbiotic relationship uh, with the host. Mainly they biosynthesize secondary metabolites which have various types of bioactivities uh, such as antibacterial, anti-cancer, etc. Uh, Cyperus area is a plant that belongs to the Cyperaceae family and it is commonly called as rice flat sage and Cyperaceae family plants are a good uh, reservoirs for the endophytic fungi. Curvelaria lunata is an endophytic fungus that we isolated from Cyprus area. Previously, antibacterial compound called lunatin was isolated from uh, the marine sponge uh, Nymphus olimeda. Uh, our research objective was to isolate antibacterial compounds from the crude extract of endophytic Curvelaria lunata and structural elucidation of the active compounds. Uh, this is the methodology. First, uh, we collected the cyperacilia plants from the Mathale district, Veragam area, and they were authenticated from the National Herbarium of Peradenia. Next, uh, the roots and aerial parts of the area were surface sterilized. After that, endophytic fungi was isolated using antibiotic enriched PDA medium. Then subculturing was carried out and uh, pure cultures was obtained from the uh, isolated fungi. And after that, uh, small scale extraction was done in order to carry out the antibacterial assay to check the bioactivity. And uh, the fungi was identified as Curvelaria lunata. And then uh, large scale culturing of the identified Curvelaria lunata was done in 140 PDA plates and they were incubated for 21 days. Uh, after that, it was extracted into ethyl acetate and the bioactivity was confirmed against uh, Staphylococcus aureus and Bacillus cereus. Uh, next, solvent solvent partitioning was done. Uh, of the crude extract using the Kapchan scheme. Uh, there we did a bioassay to check the bioactivity of the three fractions and uh, we selected the active chloroform layer for size exclusion chromatography uh, using Cephadex LH20 and methanol as the eluent. There we got several uh, chromatographic fractions and these fractions were combined according to their TLC profiles. After that, we got all eight combined fractions and they were subjected to agar distribution assay against Staphylococcus aureus and Bacillus cereus. Uh, next, we selected the fraction C, D and E for the normal phase silica chromatography. Uh, there also we got several chromatographic fractions and uh, they were combined according to their TLC profiles. Uh, after that, we selected 19 fractions uh, which had interesting spots for the biotography against gram-positive uh, Staphylococcus aureus, Bacillus cereus, and gram-negative E. coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa, while uh, these 19 fractions were sent to obtain the proton NMR. By analyzing the proton NMR of fraction D11 and D12, we decided that uh, these two fractions have a similar compound because uh, they show similar peaks in their proton NMR. And uh, these fractions were further purified using uh, C18 reverse phase HPLC with acetonitrile and water, and it yielded a pure compound called uh, D12-1. 
and uh, the structure of D12-1 was elucidated using mass 1D and 2D uh, NMR data. After that, finally, we did a minimum inhibition concent inhibitor concentration assay against uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, next, uh, we'll move on to the results and discussion section. Uh, at the beginning, Curvalaria lunata showed an antibacterial activity uh, of 9 and 13 millimeter inhibition zone against Staphylococcus aureus and Bacillus cereus. And fungi in 140 plates yielded 354 milligram of crude. According to the TLC, uh, the fungal crude showed many compounds, and uh, also large scale crude extract shows an antibacterial activity with 13 millimeter inhibition zone against Bacillus cereus. And uh, these are the TLC profiles uh, we got from the solvent solvent partitioning. And uh, you can see according to this TLC profile, most of the compounds are concentrated in the chloroform fraction. And also chloroform fraction gives an antibacterial activity of 13 millimeter inhibition zone uh, against Bacillus cereus. Therefore, we decided to further purify the chloroform fraction. Uh, here you can see the TLC profiles of the com eight combined fractions that we got from size exclusion chromatography. Uh, here there are major compounds, major spots we can see in almost all the fractions. Uh, this is the result of the agar disc diffusion assay that we done for the eight combined fractions after silica column chromatography. Here you can see the images of the TLC, combined TLC uh, of fractions D, fraction C, D, and fraction E. Uh, marked fractions were sent to the University of British Columbia uh, Canada to obtain proton NMR. These are the images of the biotography and the reference TLC. Uh, here you can see fraction D11 and D12 showed a good activity in the biotography. Uh, and also fraction D11 and D12 has the same bioactive compound. These are the images of the other bio, biotography. Uh, this is the summary of the biotography that we have done. Uh, from this, we can conclude fraction D11, D12, and E11 has a good activity. Uh, and by analyzing mass 1D and 2D spectral data, the structure of compound D12-1 was elucidated as cytokalcin B. And the structure of cytokalcin B was compared with the previously reported spectral data. And the structure was co confirmed. Uh, here you can see the structure of cytokalcin B and the proton NMR. Cytokalcin B was first isolated from a soil fungus former species and uh, cytokalcin B is also known as formin and it is reported for in vitro cytostatic activity. Uh, these are the other spectral data that we have obtained for cytokalcin B. MIC for cytokalcin B against Staphylococcus aureus was 64 microgram per milliliter and MIC of the positive control against Staphylococcus aureus was 4 microgram per milliliter. And uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first report of antibacterial activities of cytokalcin B. Uh, from this study, we can conclude that uh, endophytic Cavalaria lunata of Cyprus area are potential producers of antibacterial compounds and cytokalcin B isolated from C. lunata 
showed good antibacterial activity against Staphylococcus aureus and antibacterial activity of cytokalasin B against Staphylococcus aureus was not previously reported and findings of this current study can be used to develop uh, new antibiotics and it can be a solution for the antibiotic resistivity crisis in the world. As future directions, we would like to recommend the further purification and structure oxidation of the compounds in other chromatographic fractions and also modification of the structure to enhance the bioactivities and investigation of other bioactivities of the isolated compounds. Before the end of my presentation, I would like to acknowledge Uwe Velasi University for the financial support given and Professor Raymond Anderson, Dr. David Williams, Department of Chemistry, University of British Columbia, Canada, uh, for the updating of proton and MR. Thank you very much. Thank you, Two D N M R X course spectroscopic data. Yeah, but we obtained the course and uh, HSQC NMR graphs and we analyzed it uh, to get the structure. Uh, from the H1 NMR, we get the uh, proton skeleton, proton position. And uh, from C13, uh, we got the carbon skeleton of the uh, compound. And uh, from C, we got the hydrogen hydrogen coupling. And uh, from HMBC, uh, we got the uh, relation between carbon and hydrogen. Uh, likewise, by analyzing all the spectral data. Uh, in sorry. Yes. Uh, in HSQC, uh, we can get the can correlation of uh, two nuclei uh, with uh, one bond. And uh, in HMBC, uh, we get the direct yes, uh, connection uh, of carbon uh, and uh, hydrogen. Uh, yes. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, because uh, cytokalsin B is known for cytostatic activity mainly. And uh, we have detected the antibacterial activity of cytokalsin B. Yeah. Yes, to the best of our knowledge, it was not previously reported.
we can uh, use by when we are synthesizing the compound we can uh, attach different types of uh, uh, struct i mean compounds to the structure and check the activity No. Yes. Uh, it was done by all of us. I mean, all the authors. Our next presenter is H.P. Sandeepani. The title of the presentation is Antibacterial Activity of Entomopathogenic fungi isolated from Vespa affinis and Apis dosata in Sri Lanka. Uh, the authors of this uh, research are H.P. Sandeepani and P.B. Ratnavira. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, I'm here to present my research findings on antibacterial activity of entomopathogenic fungi isolated from Aphis dosata and Vespa affinis in Sri Lanka. Uh, let's move to the introduction. Uh, this entomopathogenic fungus is a type of parasitic fungus that causes diseases in insects and eventually kill these insects. When it comes to the mode of action of this entomopathogenic fungus, uh, starting from a conidial spores of this fungus, uh, mentioned by let, simple letter A, it develops into a germ tube, and then this germ tube gets landed on the surface of this insect. It produces appressorium. It's a kind of special cell that used to punch the insect cuticle, and then they produce hyphal bodies and invade the host tissues, uh, causing the death of this insects. After that, this fungal emerges from the dead host, producing thousands of uh, similar kind of these spores. 
uh, let's move to some novel metabolites from entomopathogenic fungus. Uh, here I have mentioned three novel metabolites uh, from the literature. First one is spiridovirisin. It's having cytotoxic activity. And then second one is spiridomacrolidin. It's used to treat neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, diseases. And the third one is b -vericine. Uh, it's having antimicrobial and antiviral activity. Uh, though I have mentioned only three novel metabolites, there are so many metabolites, uh, bioactive compounds isolated from this entomopathogenic fungi having different bioactivities, uh, including insecticidal, antifungal, immunosuppressive, and so on. Uh, let's move to our research problem. Here we have to know about what is this antibiotics first. Uh, these antibiotics are the medicines that we use to treat or pre prevent bacterial infections. And uh, what is this antibiotic resistance? Antibiotic resistance is a serious issue that occur when these bacteria stop responding to these antibiotics. This mainly occurs due to misuse and overuse of antibiotics keeping leftover medications for the future use and obtaining antibiotics without prescriptions. So then this bacteria become, uh, the, become the form of super virulent form. And uh, this drug resistance of this pathogenic bacteria is becoming a severe issue nowadays. So the most common drug resistant bacterial families uh, from the literature I have found that Enterobacteria CA and Pseudomonas. And therefore, it's an, uh, there is an urgent need to discover novel antibacterial drug leads. Uh, in this case, natural products play a major role since they are a uh, source of potential drugs. So that the entomopathogenic fungi are one such natural resource under consideration for the discovery of uh, novel, novel metabolite um, antibacterial drug leads. Therefore, our major objective of this research is isolation of entomopathogenic fungi from Aphis dorsata, that is honeybee, and Vespa affinis, that is lesser banded hornet, found in Sri Lanka, and evaluating the antibacterial activity of their crude fungal extracts. Uh, when it comes to the specific objectives of our research, they are as listed. Uh, first, the isolation of these entomopathogenic fungi from the selected cadavers, and then their subculturing. After that, extraction of secondary metabolites, and then evaluating their antibacterial activity, and identification of those isolated fungi. Let's move to the methodology of our research. This is the methodology that we have followed throughout our research. First, we have collected freshly dead insect cadavers of Aphis dorsata and Vespa affinis from Uwavellasa University premises Badulla. And then they were authenticated from National Museum Colombo. After that, they were surface sterilized. Um, next, this entomopathogenic fungi were isolated from the collected cadavers in PDA plates uh, enriched with antibiotic. After that, isolated entomopathogenic fungi were subcultured in PDA medium until pure cultures were obtained. Then uh, after pure cultures were obtained, each pure culture was uh, subcultured in 10 PDA dishes and incubated close to sporulation. After that, uh, secondary metabolites were extracted into ethyl acetate solvent and the crude fungal extracts were obtained uh, by evaporating the solvent. Then the antibacterial activity of these isolated crude extracts were evaluated using agar diffusion method and bioautographic method against Staphylococcus aureus, Bacillus cereus, Pseudomonas serogenosa, and Escherichia coli. Uh, in these bioassays, we use methanol as the negative control and gentamicin as the positive control. Uh, later, we the secondary metabolites of the crude extracts were analyzed using TLC and FTIR studies. 
After that, the entomopathogenic fungi were identified using molecular techniques, commercially through the gene tech, and the obtained sequence were bioedited using edit using bioedit software, and then blast analyzed to get their identities. Uh, finally, the statistical data was analyzed using Minitab software. Let me take you to the major portion of our research, result and discussion. Uh, these are the nine entomopathogenic fungi that we have isolated from the cadaver of Aphis dosata. These are the eight entomopathogenic fungi that we have isolated from the cadaver of Vespa affinis. Uh, when it comes to the molecular identification of the fungi, um, these tables give the identities of the fungi. Uh, among the 17 fungal isolates, uh, nine fungal isolates belongs to the genus of Aspergillus. And when it comes to the TLC study of the entomopathogenic crude extracts, by looking at these TLC profi profiles, it's clear that all these crude, all crude extracts uh, having consist of number of secondary metabolites. And this is the FTIR study for the entomopathogenic crude extracts. Um, these are the FTIR graphs for the crude extracts from Aphis dosata. And most of them represent interesting functional groups, including hydroxyl groups, carbonyl groups, as well as HP3 hybridized CH stretches. And uh, these are the FTIR graphs obtained for the crude extracts of Vespa affinis. Uh, these, some of these also contain interesting functional groups, including hydroxyl, carbonyl, and CH stretches, HP3 hybridized. Uh, here, the previous, it, it was previously reported that hydroxyl and carbonyl uh, groups respond for the inhibitory activity against microorganisms. Uh, these are the test bacterial species that we have used uh, during bioassays. Two gram positive bacteria and two gram negative bacteria we have used. Uh, when it comes to the results of our diffusion bioassay, the crude extracts of uh, BB1 fungus, that is Talromyces versatilis, uh, it gives inhibition zone of 13 millimeter. It's quite similar for the inhibition zone given by positive control gentamicin. Uh, so that inhibition zone of BB1 extract showed similar effect to the positive control. These are the rest of uh, results obtained for the bioassay, uh, this diffusion bioassay. Here also I have mentioned the previous one since it's given similar activity to the its positive control against Escherichia coli bacteria. And these are the results obtained for the bioassay for the entomopathogenic crude extracts of Vespa affinis. And I want to say that out of 17 fungal strains isolated, 13 fungal species were active against at least one tested bacteria. Uh, among those Taleromyces versatilis, BB1 fungus, it is isolated from Aphis dosata. It shows a good antibacterial activity against Escherichia coli. And uh, the results of this bioautography revealed that Polar compounds are responsible for the activity of this uh, Talromyces versatilis, and moderating nonpolar compounds are responsible for the activity of Aspergillus nomius and Aspergillus niger. The activity may be single metabolite, due to single metabolite or group of metabolite can be. Uh, there are also some relevant studies I have mentioned. Uh, those represent that Aspergillus nomius, Aspergillus flavors, and um, Aspergillus fumigators were reported entomopathogens. And this Aspergillus species having uh, activity against gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Uh, though there are several Aspergillus species isolated in this study, uh, there are some other fungal 
species that isolated previously not reported as entomopathogens and also this antimicrobial activity of thalamomyces versatilis uh, also has not previously reported uh, when it comes to the conclusion of our study this is the first study to isolate entomopathogenic fungi from these cadavers of aphis dorsata and vespa apennis and these cadavers have a number of entomopathogenic fungi with antibacterial activity and aspergillus species was um, abundant among the isolated fungi results of tlc and ftir revealed that uh, they produce a number of secondary metabolites thalamomyces versatilis gave the good antibacterial activity against e coli bacteria it's a novel finding and finally entomopathogenic fungi of aphis dorsata and vespa aphis can be a potential source for discovery of novel antibacterial drug leads uh, for the future direction we want to suggest that isolation and structural elucidation of bioactive compounds present in the active entomopathogenic fungal crude extracts and other bioassays in order to determine activities such as antioxidant antifungal and so on from the same crudes before winding of my presentation i would like to thank you to the uvelasa university for the financial support given and dr manori gunatilaka assistant director of entomology department of national museum colombo for assisting in authentication of the insects thank you to have an idea about what kind of functional groups present in these particular crude extracts we did that ftir um we extracted the um, fungal metabolites to the ethyl acetate and then the crude extracts were dissolved in methanol and taken for the bioassays Uh, in ir studies we dissolve them in acetone and after the evaporation of acetone then we take the readings uh, ah yeah. yes and uh, how can you know that this fungi that you have ordered They need this insect or whether it is coming from outside because it is just. If you use the surface. Yeah, surface sterilization. We did. No, I have mentioned. Yes, that I was only that everything is done. And I was also worried about this eye aspect of that particular. So I am sure that we have different. Oh, because most of them are. Very similar to each other. Uh, so maybe that I was thinking like this. If you use acetone, yeah. how did you make sure that the normal acetone in your what you do? Like your sample. Ah, uh, sample was loaded and kept for some times for the operation of the acetone. Do you need to keep it for that long? Ah, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So they are very similar to each other. Mm. suitable uh, medium for the fungal growth is pda i used because of that reason and in the bioassay i grow the bacteria in the medium so that the mullahinton was uh, very good for the bacterial growth so that i use mullahinton
What is it that you use for the photography to separate the fashion? No, I didn't. Uh, you just uh, extract the crude. Uh, Crude. Yeah. No, I just take oh. the uh, check the antibacterial activity of the crude extracts. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. I know, uh, no, no. The next speaker is P.B. Ratnavira. The title of the presentation is Antibacterial Activities of Peptaballs, Tricoceling A1 and B2, isolation from, isolated from ethnophytic fungi, Trichoderma recessi. The other authors are DPH Madhushika, JMNM Jayasundara, DE Williams, ED De Silva, and RJ Anderson. Good afternoon to all of you. Today I'm going to present you about our research on antibacterial activities of peptide balls, trichocelin A1 and B2, isolated from the endophytic fungus, trichoderma resi. Well, I believe all of you are aware that uh, about the antibiotic resistant crisis that exists in the world. This has evolved basically due to the misuse and overuse of antibiotics. Accordingly, the bacteria have developed resistance to the existing antibiotics, making most of them no longer effective against the common infections. As you can see in this graph, the antibiotic streptomycin was created in 1943 and it has become resistant uh, in 1958. Similarly, for tetracycline and methicillin, re resistance has built up after six and two years respectively uh, following their development. Under this situation, if we fail to address the problem of antibiotic resistance, this could result in 10 million deaths by 2050, while posing a huge impact on the economy of the world. Therefore, there's a pressing need to discover novel antibacterial drug leads as a solution uh, for this antibiotic resistant crisis. You may all know that the first antibiotic, penicillin, which was discovered by Sir Alexander Fleming, was initially isolated from a fungus, Penicillium chrysogenum. Similarly, most of the antibiotics and other therapeutics 
have also been isolated initially from a natural source. And still, scientists are working hard to discover novel antibacterial drug leads to cater this issue of antibiotic resistance by investigating novel, resor novel resources from nature. Endophytic fungi is such a relati relatively an untapped resource being used to isolate bioactive compounds. These endophytic fungi, they live in the internal tissues of plants without causing any symptoms of disease to the host. During their life cycle, they biosynthesize a number of secondary metabolites and they are reported to possess various biological activities. And there have been several studies conducted in Sri Lanka on isolating bioactive compounds from endophytic fungi. And from those findings, we saw that Sri Lankan endophytes also biosynthesize interest in chemical scaffold. And here I have shown some of those bioactive compounds that have been isolated from endophytes of Sri Lankan plants. Meanwhile, uh, we were able to isolate a novel antibiotic, a novel chemical structure, a potent antibiotic from the fungus Rhizoctonia solani obtained from the roots of the Cypress rotandus plant. And this uh, antibiotic, this solanoic acid, exhibited very high activity against methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So, this study triggered us to investigate more on Cypressae family plants. So, further studies on Cypressae family plants revealed that these plants harbor a lot of endophytic fungi. And according to the results obtained, more than 90% of the isolated fungi showed antibacterial activity. And for the current study, we selected Cyprus area because the endophytic fungal status of Cyprus area or their bioactive compounds have not been previously investigated. Accordingly, the objective of the current study was to isolate antibacterial secondary metabolites of endophytic trichoderma resi fungus isolated from Cyprus area in Sri Lanka. Now let's move on to the methodology. First, I will explain about the isolation of trichoderma resi. So Cyprus area plants were collected from Matale Veragama area and those plants were authenticated from the National Herbarium Peradenia. After that, these plants were, uh, uh, after collection, these plants were brought to the laboratory under humid conditions. They were washed and then surface sterilized. The surface sterilized plant parts were opened, the tissues of the plant parts were opened, and they were placed on uh, antibiotic enriched potato dextrose agar plates. And they were incubated until the fungi emerged. So emerging fungi were then isolated and subcultured until pure fungi were obtained. Each pure fungus was again subcultured in six PDA dishes and incubated close to sporulation, then extracted into ethyl acetate. The crude extracts of these uh, fungal extracts were then checked for antibacterial assay activity against two gram positive Staphylococcus aureus, Bacillus cereus, and two gram negative bacteria, Pseudomonas erginosa and Escherichia coli, using agar distribution method. At the same time, isolated endophytic fungi were identified using molecular techniques commercially through gene tech. From the results of the distribution assay for the crudes, uh, we found that the trichoderma resi fungus. Uh, is highly active against the gram-positive bacteria we checked. Therefore, this trichoderma resi fungus was selected for further isolation of bioactive metabolites. Next, this trichoderma resi fungus was grown in large scale, incubated for 13 days, and then extracted into ethyl acetate. 
after evaporating the solvent crude was obtained and this crude was again checked for bioactivity this is just to confirm that the activity is still there after large scale culturing so out of 199 petri dishes we were able to obtain a crude of approximately 1 gram then this crude was used to isolate the bioactive compounds using a bioassay guided purification method this is the purification process uh, we used to isolate the active compounds first the ethyl acetate crude extract was fractionated using solvent solvent partitioning uh, use uh, then the frac four fractions obtained were subjected to a antibacterial bioassay the active fraction there was the chloroform fraction then this chloroform fraction was further fractionated using cefadex lh20 size exclusion chromatography using methanol as the eluent then the uh, fractions obtained were combined according to the their tlc profiles and uh, and we received six combined fractions those six combined fractions were also tested for antibacterial activity and we found fraction fraction b was the active fraction out of those six and that fraction b was further purified using c18 reverse phase high performance liquid chromatography using acetonitrile acetonitrile trial and water to achieve to uh, to obtain two pure compounds then for the pure compounds mass and nmr spectroscopic data were obtained and using this spectral data as well as the reported data the structures of the two compounds were elucidated as tricosylene b2 and tricosylene a1 which are some peptide bonds so the primary amino acid sequence for these peptide bonds are given in this slide so this is uh, this uh, tricosylenes have been first isolated from the fungus trichoderma viridae and also from other some other gene, genera like emerise phelopsis and gliocladium however the current study is the first isolation of tricosylenes from the fungus trichoderma resi then uh, these are the spectral data we obtain for tricosylene b and tricosylene a now i will explain about the antibacterial activities obtained for the fractions and the tricosylenes the chloroform fraction obtained from solvent solvent partitioning gave a 10 and 12 mm inhibition zones respectively against staphylococcus aureus and bacillus cereus while the active fraction from size exclusion chromatography gave an inhibition zone of 12.3 for staphylococcus aureus and 13 for bacillus cereus the minimum inhibitory concentration as uh, concentrations were determined for the two pure compounds and for tricosylene 1 the mic was 32 uh, against staphylococcus aureus and 64 for bacillus cereus for tricosylene b1 the mic values for were 16 and 8 for staphylococcus aureus and bacillus cereus respectively the positive control used for these all these studies for gentamicin and for the mic obtained for the gentamicin was 2 microgram per ml with that now i will present the conclusions of our study tricosylene a1 and b2 were isolated from an endophytic trichoderma resi fungus and this is the first to isolate tricosylenes from an endophytic trichoderma resi fungus antibact to the best of our knowledge these antibacterial activities of tricosylene and a1 and b2 were not previously reported this and finally this study revealed that the isolated tricosylenes from trichoderma resi are potential antibacterial compounds before winding up i would like to acknowledge the national science foundation research grant for funding this research thank you very much
They are known compounds, madam. Isolated from this fungus, Trichoderma resi. No, uh, for trichocillins, they are normally uh, in some, they have mentioned as antibiotics, but we didn't find any antibacterial activity for trichocillin A1 and B2. Yes, uh, we not only check for antibacterial activity, we also check for insecticidal, antifeedant, and oil deterrent activities against the insect pest called uh, Plutella shilostella. But here we didn't present uh, the, that part because that's a whole different thing. So these two compounds showed very good activities for those assays as well, for those antifeedant assays as well. Uh, this was started by an MPhil student, and uh, the compounds were not enough at the end to check the uh, the pure compounds were not enough to check the uh, final activities, like for the antifeedant and antibacterial. Therefore, I asked an uh, undergraduate student to grow this fungus again. She extracted and she isolated the, isolated the compounds again. Then she's the, um, the undergraduate is the one who checked the two pure compounds against these activities. Yes, peptide balls. Uh, Uh, the question is not clear to me. Uh, so these peptide balls are, uh, pep uh, they are not 20 residue pep uh, peptides. Um, I don't know about an advantage, but this is, uh, I can't say it is an advantage because synthesizing it is difficult. And structural oxidation of these peptide balls was also very difficult. So I think uh, if there are any other small antibiotics, they will be more advantageous than using the peptide balls for any activity, for, for any pharmaceutical purpose. Sorry? Yes, we can try that. We can figure out the genes and uh, we'll try expressing those genes as a, uh, another step. Uh, maybe because yes, but the final MIC was uh, done in liquid medium, so it is it doesn't uh, yes, connect with the inhibitor. Uh, Yes, yes, it's uh, under the standard protocols. The intermycin is there.
the next speaker is rajita k ratnayaka the topic of the presentation is cytotoxic effects of resorcinolic lipid isolated from mangifera zelenica in a human cancer cell panel the other authors are samira r samarakon mk edirivira h k h tennakon a adhikari and dinara s gunasekar Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Kalum Ratnayaka. Uh, my research topic is cytotoxic effect of a resorcinolic lipid isolated from Mangifera zelenica in a human cancer cell panel. Uh, my presentation includes introduction, objective, methodology, results, discussion, and conclusion parts. So, cancer. Uh, the word simply we can describe as uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells in the body. Uh, cancer, it is a single word, but uh, uh, that top under the that topic, there are more than hundred type of cancers. In here, I showed uh, the major categories of cancer like multiple myeloma, blastoma, melanoma, sarcoma, carcinoma, uh, lymphoma, and leukemia types. Uh, in here, uh, this article was published on uh, 2018 by WHO. They tell us uh, by this article, cancer burden rise to 18.1 million uh, new cases and 9.6 million uh, cancer deaths in 2018. Uh, all these numbers are in millions in 2019. Uh, that's why we need to do more uh, research on uh, cancer. These are the existing uh, treatment methods, uh, surgery, hormone therapy, stem cell transplant, immunotherapy, uh, radiation therapy, uh, and chemotherapy, chemotherapy to prevent and uh, cure cancer. But up to now, there is no uh, specific drug to cure cancer. Uh, more than 60% of uh, anti-cancer drugs are isolated from uh, the nature and as uh, natural uh, compounds from nature, uh, wing twisting, wing blasting uh, from catharanthus rosius and paclitaxel, these are the uh, well known anti cancer drugs. Uh, Resosonic lipid, this, uh, this is the molecule I used in my research, and uh, this compound was isolated uh, by Mangifera serenica in single atom. A hexane, hexane extract of the, the bark of Mangifera selenica. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this is the structure of uh, this compound. And uh, uh, this article on this molecule was published by the uh, IBM BB uh, uh, on 2017. And they found uh, I, uh, cytotoxic activity of uh, this compound on MCF7 breast cancer cell line. My objective is to evaluate a uh, cytotoxic effect uh, of RL, uh, this resosonic lipid on cell panel contains uh, cancer cell lines and uh, uh, human uh, normal cell line. In the methodology part, uh, I, uh, I use the same, uh, same compound and dissolved and uh, prepared uh, dilution series. Uh, then uh, I treat this compound uh, with cancer cells after 48 hour incubation, I've done SRB assay. SRB assay is a colorimetric assay. Uh, and then I've taken uh, the absorbance readings by using multiplet reader and uh, calculated IC50 values uh, by using uh, 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 statistical analysis software. This is the uh, simple diagram of SRB assay. You can see uh, uh, first that, uh, that cell is uh, without, without treat, uh, treating. 
after treat with compound and then after 48 hour incubation period i add uh, we have to add uh, srb dye this dye is bright pink anionic protein staining bind dye uh, uh, it binds to basic amino acids of cellular proteins then uh, we need to uh, rinse the bound dye uh, uh, bound dye and uh, we have to uh, take absorbance uh, values from the bound dye then based on the measurement of cellular protein content uh, it's proportional to cell viability srb assay is uh, used for cell density determination based on the uh, measurement of cellular protein these are the cancer cell lines i used in this research uh, the last uh, uh, one uh, hek293 is a normal embryonic kidney cells and all other cell lines are cancer different type of cancer cell lines in the results part uh, ic50 values you know ic50 value it is a half maximal inhibitory concentration and the value of the, uh, the ic50 value is inversely proportional to the cytotoxicity uh, all these values are in uh, microgram per ml uh, after 48 hour post incubation period i summarize summarize my data on this uh, bar diagram uh, you can uh, the, uh, the blue color indicate the uh, cytotoxic effect of resosonic lipid compound and i uh, black color indicates the uh, uh, paclitaxel paclitaxel is a positive control i used uh, it is a drug uh, drug compound uh, here you can see the uh, clearly see the uh, cytotoxic effect of resosonic lipid is highly toxic on uh, this is this hek293 is a normal uh, normal cell line uh, it is uh, toxic than the reference positive control drug but we, we what we comparing the uh, cytotoxicity of uh, this resosonic lipid on uh, normal cell line cancer cell lines most of the can cancer cell lines are used uh, you can see uh, it, th this compound showed high cytotoxic activity than the uh, normal cell line when we see these five five cancer five cancer cell lines this uh, resosonic lipid showed uh, higher cytotoxic activity than the uh, this positive control drug uh, hs570 this cell line this cell line is a triple negative breast cancer cell line uh, this uh, resosonic lipid showed potent cytotoxic you can see ic50 value 0.007 than uh, the uh, posi uh, positive control and also this showed uh, potent cytotoxic activity on enterato this is a, a cancer stem cell like cell line uh, this compound resosonic lipid showed potent uh, activity on hs5780 uh, and enterato cell lines these are the morphological pictures i i obtain uh, by uh, page contrast microscope you can uh, clearly see the number of cells in the first slide i uh, indicate the uh, uh, morphological picture of the well without treating any compound in, in first slide first, uh, first uh, picture and with the concentration uh, uh, lowest concentration is a 1.56 and uh, highest concentration is 12.5 uh, with the concentration uh, the number of cells decreasing with the Uh, dose be dependent man dependent manner in discussion part uh, resosonic lipid showed potent cytotoxic activity against all the cancer cell uh, lines than normal cell line except for uh, achn uh, kidney cancer cell line and uh, also resosonic lipid showed a uh, higher cytotoxicity on uh, this hs5780 breast cancer cell line NCA H two nine two is a lung cancer cell line. AN three CA it is a uterus cell line, cancer cell line. CACO two it is a colorectal cancer cell line, and A four thirty one is a skin cancer cell line. Uh, then positive control. IC fifty values of the resosonic lipid in HS five seven eighty and Entera two cancer cell lines confirms it selective cytotoxic activity. This is the major finding of uh, this research. 
uh, it, uh, this, com uh, this compound shows selective cytotoxic activity on uh, these two cell lines. And also when comparing resosonic lipid, when comparing resosonic lipid shows its cytotoxicity nearly 450 times higher than positive control. So see, uh, you, uh, I, uh, the, in the table I showed uh, the uh, cytotoxicity of uh, this uh, uh, compound on HS5780 is 0 0.007. Uh, IC50 value than uh, uh, in uh, triple negative breast cancer cell line. Conclusion, based on the results I obtained from the SRB assay, compound resosonic lipid uh, has dose dependent cytotoxic effect on used cancer cell panel than non-cancerous embryonic kidney cells. And also it expressed highly selective cytotoxic activity on HS5780 breast cancer cell lines. Uh, finally, uh, thank you uh, for the NSF for granting me and uh, all the technical support uh, I obtained from the IBM BB. Thank you very much. Uh, these are my references. And thank you. Uh, breast cancer lines, sir. Uh, I, 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 I tell that because of the, uh, the cytotoxic activity, IC50 value, uh, it is uh, 0 0.007. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, because previous study of this compound, uh, uh, they also found the, this uh, compound uh, highly active with the uh, MCF7 breast cancer cell line. In here, I, I used uh, only eight uh, different cancer cell lines. Uh, with comparing in this study, on, uh, in this study, it, it has higher, very high uh, cytotoxic activity. Can you tell about the properties of the compound? What is the solubility? The solubility in lipids? Yeah, the, uh, yes, sir. this is a more nonpolar compound uh, because uh, I uh, we extract in the uh, researchers e e extract this compound using hexane extract, uh, and also it has some lipid part. Uh, the, the, I, I didn't done another studies with, uh, on. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, the yes. yes, thank you. Yes, madam. Uh, I have to I have to do more uh, further research to confirm what is the what are the uh, uh, reactions happen uh, for the, the, this uh, results because uh, there should be uh, some specific pathways uh, inhibiting by this uh, compound uh, because uh, uh, cancer for cancer there are uh, specific pathways to in inducing like BCL2. Uh, like pathways, uh, I have to confirm what are what is what are the pathways uh, react with this compound. Uh, The next speaker is MHAY Gunavardhana. Her uh, title of her presentation is Exploring Bioactive Compounds in the Endolichenic Fungus, Silaria Fijiensis, Inhabiting the Lichens, Graphis liber, uh, Librata, collected from Negambo Lagoon, Sri Lanka. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Anuttara. Today, my presentation is going to be on. Okay, shall I continue?
Shall I continue? Yes. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Anuttara. Uh, today, my presentation is on exploring bioactive compounds in the endolichenic fungus, Cytharia pigenesis, inhibiting the lichen, Rapidratha, collected in Mutambal Lagoon, Sri Lanka. First of all, we'll see what are the lichens. A lichen is a symbiosis between algae or cyanobacteria with filamentous fungi. In a lichen, other than this callus making filamentous fungi, we can find another type called the endolichenic fungi. So, the, what is the speciality about them? Actually, they produce bioactive secondary metabolites in order to protect their lichen against herbivores, microbial invasions, and harmful process, very handy properties such as cytotoxic properties, antimicrobial properties, radical scavenging properties, anti-inflammatory properties, anti-diabetic properties, and so on. So let me uh, give you a brief introduction about my studied fungus, Shailaria pheogenesis. It belongs to Ascomycota fungal lineage. Other than inside lichens, they can also be found inside leaves. So the speciality about them, they produce large macroscopic spike-like stromata as their reproductive structure. So my studied culture of Shailaria pigenesis has been isolated from the gra lichen, Graphis librata, from the mangrove plant, Rhizopora mucronata in Nigambol Lagoon. Throughout the history, there are several reports on isolating novel bioactive compounds from endolichenic fungi in Sri Lanka. Isolating these two new compounds from the endolichenic fungi, Curvularia trifoli. So the compound one has shown cytotoxic activity in the bioactivity testing and also this compound has shown both antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activity. And also these three compounds which have been isolated from the penicillium citrinum has uh, shown antioxidant activity while this compound, this novel compound from Shailaria sidi has shown cytotoxic activity against human lung cancer cell line. So we can see the importance of uh, exploring endolichenic fungi for more novel metabolites. Objectives. The main objective of this research was to isolate novel bioactive metabolites from Shailaria pheogenesis, which brings to my second objective, to test the antibacterial and antioxidant activity of fruit extract from Shailaria pheogenesis and then to perform bioassay bio compounds. Okay, now we will move on to the methodology results and discussion. A solid culture of Shailaria pheogenesis was obtained from the Department of Chemistry in University of Kalania. It was uh, cultured on 60 potato dectrose agar medium containing petri dishes and incubated for 14 days. When the mycelium have fully grown, the media were cut into small pieces and the metabolites were extracted to ethyl acetate by shaking overnight. The crude extract was dried and it was subjected to bioactivity testing 
by DPPH radical scavenging assay and agar well diffusion antibacterial assay. So the DPPH radical scavenging assay was performed for the crude and the standard butylated hydroxytoluene. In 96 well microplate, uh, methanolic DPPH was uh, incubated with different concentration of sample for 20 minutes under dark. Then absorbances were measured at 520 nanometer. Finally, percentage inhibition versus concentration was plotted. As you can see in this graph, compared to the standard butylated hydroxytoluene, unfortunately, our crude sample showed low antioxidant activity. So this assay was not carried further. In the second assay, which is agar diffusion antibacterial assay, this assay was performed against Escherichia coli, Staphylococcus aureus, and Bacillus subtilis. In one nutrient agar wells, one for the positive control azithromycin, Second, for the negative control, dimethyl sulfoxide. Other two wells are for the two trials for the crude. After 24 hour incubation, the diameter of the inhibition zone was measured. In the results, as you can see, our crude samples showed higher antibacterial activity against all three tested bacterial strains. Most importantly, it showed same inhibition zone diameter as the positive control, which is azithromycin, against Bacillus subtilis and Staphylococcus aureus. So in the next stage, the crude extract was partitioned according to polarity. First, the crude was dissolved in 80% methanol and it was partitioned with the non-polar solvent hexane. The hexane layer was removed and the methanol layer was diluted to 60% methanol and again partitioned with the moderately polar solvent chloroform. So three fractions were collected and they were dried and they were subjected to antibacterial assay. Also, a TLC was performed and observed under UV and fluorescence light in order to identify how many compounds are in each fraction and compare the similarity of each fractions. And most importantly, find a better separating solvent system in future column chromatographies. In the results, as you can see, Our crude sample showed higher antibacterial activity for both hexane and chloroform fraction. Unfortunately, it didn't show any against any of the tested bacterial strains. So a normal pair silica gel column chromatography was performed for the hexane fraction. It was eluded with hexane, dichloromethane, methanol solvent system. Finally, 25 fractions were collected. And a TLC was developed in order to find uh, similar fractions and uh, combine them into final fractions. So, as, so we were able to compile the 25 fractions into final four fractions. And again, a TLC was uh, developed for them and observed under UV and fluorescence light. So, for the collected uh, for uh, subsequent fraction of hexane, which is H1, H2, H3, and H antibacterial activity against all three tested bacterial strains and other fractions showed no antibacterial activity against any of the tested bacteria, especially 
uh, again, you can see the H4 fraction showed same inhibition zone diameter as the positive control azithromycin against Staphylococcus aureus. So I can conclude my presentation. First, the crude extract of Shailiaria pagensis showed good antibacterial activity against Escherichia coli, Staphylococcus aureus, and Bacillus subtilis. And also, it showed low antioxidant activity in the DPPH radical scavenging assay. And finally, the H4 fraction showed same antibiotic activity as azithromycin against Staphylococcus aureus. So this is the end of my presentation. I appreciate your uh, great attention. Thank you. Sorry, I uh, can can you repeat? Did you further the infection H4 the the one the Right now we are uh, further uh, right now further purifications are being carried out in the University of Calonia. Hopefully we can get pure compounds and deduce the structures of them. Okay, the uh, Okay. Uh, even even though this uh, so even though uh, this was not this theory was not tested, in my opinion, uh, we know that uh, bacteria. Uh, so these antibacterial compounds can inhibit uh, certain enzymes that way they killed bacteria. So in my, in my opinion, uh, maybe this uh, active site of this particular enzyme, which we don't know, uh, may not accept polar compounds uh, which were extracted to methanol fraction. So we know that. Uh, so we know that uh, most of the time, active site is lined by uh, hydrophobic amino acids. So hydrophilic compounds uh, may not be accepted by the active site. To give uh, certificates for uh, participants, I would like to invite Dr. Ireshika De Silva. Miss K. H. T. P. Kumara Singh.
மிஸ் எச் பி சந்தீபனி டாக்டர் பி பி ரத்னவீர் மிஸ்டர் ராஜித கே ரத்நாயக் Thank you, Dr. Reshika. Uh, now we are having a small raffle draw. Uh, I have the names of the presenters uh, written in these sheets. So two lucky winners will be uh, provided with two gift packs uh, sponsored by Link Natural. Ms. K.H.T.P. Kumara Singh. Dr. P.B. Ratnavir. We have come to the end of our session. I would like to thank all of you for uh, participating in this session. Thank you.